Okay, everybody's very welcome um, to the Committee for Communities this morning. In the room with me, I have uh, Robin Newton and Andy Allen. And on Starleaf, we have Mark Durkin, Sinead Innes, Cara Mullen, Vice Chair Kelly Armstrong, and Alex Eason. So, can I then move on to agenda item number one, which is apologies? Have we any apologies this morning? Have you one from Fra, Sinead? Sorry, Chair, I was cutting on mute there. Yes, one from Fra, please. Thank you very much. Okay, I'm going to move on to agenda item two then, which is Chairperson's Business. Um, sorry, members, I, sorry. Sorry, no, just, I, I need to leave the meeting about 20 to 12. I'll be back for, for about 20, 25 minutes. Grant, thank you, Robin. Thanks for letting us know. Okay, members, agenda item two, Chairperson's Business. Members, we're due to receive a briefing by the deaf community about the video <coughs> relay system at the meeting on the 4th of March. Unfortunately, we've been informed that there is no ISL interpreter available through the CPD interpreter service to attend that day. The clerk is continuing to seek alternative provision. However, if an ISL interpreter cannot be sourced in time, this would mean that only a BSL interpreter would be available on that day, and our two witnesses both use BSL and are not content to proceed on that basis. Um, if members recall, we did have a briefing set out with our broadcasting services and interpreters available for the 18th of February. However, in the end, that date did not suit the key witnesses. Um, member, we have postponed this briefing on two occasions already to try to ensure that the presence of both ISL and BSL interpreters for broadcasting purposes. I don't particularly want to postpone this yet again. <coughs> Um, and I, I suppose this just calls into question the, the one of the reasons why we are having this um, uh, briefing um, because of, of the of the issues that this community have to face. And uh, just to just to, for a bit of information, um, the, the, it had been highlighted back in 2018 that there were only 28 skilled BSL interpreters and only three. ISL interpreters here in Northern Ireland making it difficult to, to source both together on those dates. So, members, I'm just looking for any comments um, on how we would proceed on the way forward with this. Sinead? <clears throat> Thank you, Chair. And listen, I fully appreciate that uh, you know this group have waited far too long to come before the committee, um, and we certainly need to get them in as soon as possible. Um, but I'm just wondering, is it a you know, uh, taking on board <clears throat> what you said regarding the availability of ISL, would it be maybe an, an option for us to ask um, our counterparts in the South, in the Dublin government, whether they would be able to make somebody available um, who's skilled in, in ISL? <clears throat> I mean, I think it's worth a try. If not, we can ask the question. If not, then I'm quite content that we continue on as you've outlined there at the start, Chair. Okay, look, thank you for that, Sinead. Um, I think that is, a, that is a good suggestion, and I know that the clerk has already made contact um, with, with our counterparts uh, in the Republic of Ireland to ask if anyone is available. Um, we also have the issue, though it has been highlighted as well to me just this morning, of um, whether they'll be allowed to travel or not up to us, but um, it, would be, it would be work that they would be travelling to do, so that might be allowed, but that is definitely one avenue we are going to explore. Um, so if members, other members are happy with that, we'll, we'll explore that avenue. And um, either way, the, the briefing will go ahead next week, but we'll try our very best to get the ISL interpreter, because I know that, um, that the, within that community, um, they will uh, be, be making it known that there will be a briefing next week. So we will, we will have people from right across the deaf community here in Northern Ireland and beyond um, that will want to tune in to watch this. So members content with that proposal, and um, we'll press on. Yeah? Thank you. Thank you very much. Members, just another two things. Um, it's come to my attention this week that people who come to live in Northern Ireland, or who have come to live in Northern Ireland over the past year, have been able to get their national insurance number due to the lack of face-to-face -face interviews during COVID. Um, so this means that they quite often then, well, obviously they can't um, access work legally. They can't access any benefits. They can't even... Um, do a, a tax return for any businesses that they've started in Northern Ireland. I know that when they, they go online, they're told to phone a number. When they phone a number, they're told they need a face-to-face -face interview, and these aren't taking place, so it's a, they're going right in circles. So, members, with your agreement, can we write to the Minister see um, when face-to-face -face interviews will resume, and in the meantime, um, how these individuals can get a national insurance number? Members agreed, agreed with that? Yeah? Agreed? Kelly? 
We live in a world as we are currently doing um, with alternative technologies. I find it quite astonishing that when people are told that they need a face-to-face -face interview, that it, that cannot be provided on some online platform, just like we're having today. Um, so I'd be asking the minister, um, you know, when these face-to-face -face meetings will resume and why an online platform has not been provided for these people? Yeah, we can ask that question. You're absolutely right. So are members content with, with those proposals and we move on to the next item? Yeah, okay. The next sorry, one, sorry, just, just sorry. Like go ahead. Do you know the number of people that this is impacting upon? I, I only know of three, but it's active. I mean, it is it's up, uh, yeah. impacting. I've had three that have contacted me. Okay. There may be others have contacted other offices and, you know, across all of us. Um, but uh, it's not a massive amount of people. So you'd imagine they would be able to do, as Kelly said, um, the likes of, of, of Zoom or one of the other platforms. Yeah. OK, members, I just wanted then another issue. And I know all of us will have received um, emails from workers who work within the, the community and voluntary sector that do identical jobs to those in the statutory sector. And they have been left out of the £500 payment. Um, I thought it better we just bring this to committee rather than each and every one of us writing through to the private office of the various departments. Um, so if, with your agreement, I, I propose that we would write to our own minister, uh, the finance minister and the health minister, because this was originally something the health minister ruled out. We had heard from Unison over the last couple of weeks how staff working within those sectors are being treated very, very differently um, to those people who are fortunate enough to work in the statutory sector. Um, so members agreed with that. No, Kelly, you want to come in? Yes, um, Chair, I'm glad that you brought that up because I was going to bring it up under any other business. I'm sure like the rest, I've had an, an extraordinary number. Um, I'm a little bit concerned by the content of the letters that have come through. As many people will know, I worked in the community and voluntary sector um, for a very long time before I became an MLA. It's a very wide sweeping clear call. It's not stating that it's just those people um, who um, have, have worked throughout the pandemic. It's it's for the whole community and voluntary sector. Now, there are people who have been furloughed. Unfortunately, there are people who are unemployed. But the whole aspect of the letter is towards people who are employed in the community and voluntary sector and makes no mention of volunteers who by and far have been um, probably the largest number of people who work in that sector. So I'm a little bit concerned at the ask. I don't think it's very clear. I think you're right that we should write to the ministers to ask what's happening with that. Um, but as we know already, there's issues with the, the payment to health workers who are employed by the trusts or, or as associates through the trust. Um, we know that there's going to be an issue with the carers payments. Um, to add this on when it's very unclear, I'm a bit concerned about the, the campaign that is taking place. I don't dispute that, that people have provided an amazing service during the pandemic. I just am not comfortable with the content of the letters that are being circulated as a lobby um, to all of us because it's very wide reaching. It doesn't represent just those people who've been working throughout the pandemic. And I do have concerns that, that Unison have completely ignored the volunteers, the volunteers that are part of the community and voluntary sector. Okay, look, that's fair enough. Uh Good points made there, Kelly. Um, I, I, I mean, from my point of view, I, I, I hadn't even thought of the volunteers, and you're absolutely right there. I was thinking of all of those many um, uh, healthcare professionals that work in the voluntary and community sector, whether that's social workers, physios, OTs, nurses, because there are many that work right across that sector. We worked for the statutory sector yeah. for some time and then moved into the the community and voluntary sector. Um, so that would be my thinking of, because they, the, if they worked in the statutory sector, they would be entitled to this, but yet not in the in the voluntary community. But I think you make a good point there about volunteers as well, who we know in our own communities have gone over and above. Um, so they have, uh, and really put themselves out there and put themselves at risk as well. Continuing to, Chair. You know, so continuing to. And continue to, yes, you're absolutely Robin. So I think then whenever we write, we maybe stipulate that on our letter, as well, that in particular we would be concerned about those um, with with similar positions to the statutory sector, and also those volunteers. If members are in agreement, agreed. Agreed. Okay. All right. Thank you, members. I'm going to then move on to agenda item three, which is the draft minutes. You'll find there are draft minutes for the 18th of January 2021 at page six. Are members content with the minutes as drafted? Content. Content. Thank you. Okay, members, we're going to move on to agenda item four, 
And just to say to you, this is massive. This matters arising. We have 21 separate items to deal with in matters arising. Um, just for the sake of our witnesses, who will start coming on shortly, because the first witness session is due to start at 9.45. Um, so at that time, wherever we are within the 21, I, if members are in agreement, we'll stop the matters arising there, go to our witness sessions, and then come back to them. Is that members all right with that? Yeah. Okay, good stuff. Yeah. Okay, then we'll go to the first item. Um, members have been provided page 16 with the latest report from the examiner of statutory rules. The examiner draws attention to two rules laid in breach of the 21 day rule. The department has provided satisfactory reason to the examiner for this breach, for these breaches. Any comments? Are you content to note? Content to note? Yes? Content to note. Item number two then is at page yeah. 25 with the departmental response on the Casement Park project and on the sub-regional stadia programme and on page 27 with a timeline. Um, the allocation of public funding approved by the previous executive remains 62.5 million with committed a GAA partnership funding of 15 million, 15 million bringing the total to 77.5. However, the current project cost estimate identified in the latest draft of the GAA full business case is 112 million. This may be subject to change depending on the conclusions of all matters associated with the planning application. Um, so with the planning process still to be finalised, the department is not in a position to provide a definite date when the project might be completed. And in relation to sub-regional stadia programmes, officials are undertaking work to provide an up-to-date evidence base. This includes a club survey and a series of strategic decisions with key stakeholders. Um, so members, um, any comments or content to note? Oh, go ahead, Alex. Sorry, Chair, uh, just oh. on that, it, it is very helpful that you come back, uh, and I know there's a letter there from the Minister for Infrastructure mm -hmm. that the, the work that is ongoing. Uh, in terms of the planning application, but I think uh, when, when the minister was on, we were asking more around cost and, and, and finance, which which they have included the figure there. And uh, while I accept that may be subject to change, I'm not sure how drastically that will change, depending on, on, on the timing of the conclusion of the planning application. She seemed to think it would change dependent on the, the detail of the approval of the planning application. But no, that's that's pretty useful. Thank you. Okay, and members, suppose it's worth noting as well, members, that uh, the, then the minister will have to present these recommendations to the executive um, for future implementation of the programme. So it's just worth remembering that as well when all of this comes together. Um, Alex, you wanted to come in and make a comment? Yeah, um, I'm just worried about the escalating costs. Um, gonna, there's thirty-four million pounds to find now. And you know, at a time and we need to support our, our workforce and businesses and our health service to get back to normal, hopefully, as we come out of the pandemic and, and our education system to help our young people and stuff. I just don't know where this money is going to come from. Um, I just think that's just spiraling out of control. And um, I, I, I do feel that. Um, we really need to look at where this money is coming from. I do feel the GA are going to have to stump up a lot more money than they have. Uh, and I know they're claiming poverty at the moment, but we just can't fund a, a vanity pro project for an organization which is actually very wealthy. Um, so um, I think we need to urge caution on this spiraling cost. And um, it's it's just very worrying at the, the amount of money, 112 million this is going to cost now, and it'll probably even go higher. Uh, and I just find that very unacceptable, to be honest with you. Okay, Chair. Sure. Alex, I have um, Robin, then Kelly and Sinead want to come in. So, Robin. Yeah, Chair, it's really around the um, area of the sub regional area. Um, uh, there is a phrase in there which gives me some cause for concern. The, the, the executive agreed the investment of 36.2 million and in the minister's reply um, the minister is saying it is now subject to available funds over the course of the next spending review period. Uh, my understanding chair was that that money was ring fenced uh, for the 
um, sub-regional state aid pro program. Um, <coughs> and uh, I'd be concerned if we're now talking that it's subject to available funds and therefore may not be available. That would give me cause for concern, Chair. Okay, thank you for highlighting that, uh, Robin. Kelly? Thank you very much, Chair. Um, Chair, just in response to Mr Easton's comments, this isn't a vanity project, and I, I would like the committee not to use such a mode of language. Um, the reason why it's not a vanity project is because Northern Ireland has invested very well in football. It's invested very well in rugby. Sorry, Mr. Easton, you're shaking your head. They have. We have Windsor Park and we have superb rugby grounds. The sub-regional stadia is a concern for me, but as someone um, who has respect for all sports, Casement Park is an important project. And while a lot of money has been pumped into it, we have to remember that it has been unreasonably delayed by a number of issues to do with planning over the years, and that has spiralled the costs. The actual build project is probably not that much more expensive than it was to begin with, but the costs have spiralled because of unintended consequences of legal actions and other delays that have taken place. I believe that Northern Ireland is the only part of the, the whole island that doesn't have a big stadia for hurling or Gaelic football, and that is we rightly should be investing in that. I would rather that the committee concentrated on the money side of things and didn't make such you know vanity projects. We could all say that the sub regional stadia is a vanity project, but we don't because that would be disrespectful. Um, what I would like to say is, I like Robin, I am very concerned about the sub regional stadia, stadia money. I would like to see the minister applying for investment through the Social Investment Fund, because that will provide a wealth of employment across the country when these stadiums are being built. Um, I think it's time that we did get this put to bed and put into a budget for going forward. Um, the Audit Office has already raised concerns about Casement Park and the spiralling costs. I think on behalf of everyone in Northern Ireland, we would like to see that project started and completed so that the costs don't spiral any further. Thank sure, you. sure. Can, can I, I come back? You just, if you can just wait, Alex, because um, Sinead has to come in as well. I'm going to bring Sinead in beforehand. Go ahead, Sinead. Thank you, Chair. And I agree a lot with what Kelly has said there. And I, I think you know, I'm very disappointed in Alex's use of, of language there. This is not a vanity project by the GEA. This is a, an executive flagship project. OK, just remember that. I think members in this committee especially need to be very mindful of, of the language they're using because it can be misconstrued and we shouldn't let our own political bias cloud our decisions uh, that we have to make in this committee. Um, and in terms of the cost, this will not be uh, 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 something that this committee will necessarily have to worry about on, on its own. As I said, this is an executive flagship project and the executive will fund this project. The executive has given commitment to it numerous times and again through NDNA. So, I mean, people should be rest assured that the executive will find the money for this project. As Kelly said, it's, it, it, Gales rightly deserve this, pro this stadium. We have not had proper facilities to train in, to play in for many, many years. Okay, so this project will happen and I think members should be extremely mindful of the type of emotive um, and, and confrontational language that they use in this committee in terms of Casement Park because people are watching and people are listening. Okay, thank you, Sinead. Alex, you wanted to come back? Yeah, well, just a load of nonsense from a couple of the members there about my comments. Um, I refute that. Yeah, well, you're wrong. And my name's Alex, but you have no problem usually in calling me. But anyway, um, you know, when we look at the Windsor Park development and Kingspan, on, um, they did not cost anywhere near this. Um, their capacity is a lot smaller, despite football being the biggest sport in the world. So to me, it is a bit of a vanity project. I accept that there's money from the executive that has to go towards this, and I'm happy enough for that. My concern is about these huge spiraling costs, and it is unacceptable, and it needs to be resolved, and money needs to be found to pay for this, and the GAA are going to have to stump up for it. So that is my argument. Thank you. Look, members, I don't want to start a row off here, and everybody is entitled to their opinion, certainly on this committee. And the, 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 anything that has been said by any member is certainly not the committee's opinion; it's members' opinion. Um, the committee have not formed an opinion on any of of, of these issues, um, and I know this this for some members um, that. Uh, the, this issue does cause them a great concern, and for other members, I, I absolutely understand as well that they see that 
um, this issue that this Casement Park is very much needed um, for, for, for that sport as well. So I don't want us to have any further argument on this, um, but each member is entitled to their opinion, but it's certainly not seen as a committee opinion. Are members content with me saying that? I know Andy, you're waiting, waiting to come in, Andy. Chair, sure, it's just to pick up on Robin's point in regard to the sub-regional, and again, I'm sure uh, Robin's concern on that, and I would ask if, if members are in agreement that we write to the Minister and ask for clarification on, on this. Uh, you know, I, it was not my understanding that it was subject to available funding, um, and I wouldn't like to think that that would be the case. I do uh, obviously recognise that if we look at the Minister's capital budget for this year, I think reflecting on what the Minister bid for, I think it was something like £329 million in capital, and when she was allocated £224 million. So her capital budget um, is under pressure similar to the resource, uh, and there will be pressures moving forward year on year as the capital uh, demands uh, and pressures increase. So I would like to get some further clarity on sub-regional. And, and I am somewhat disappointed that we, we seem to be continually consulting and engaging. And the clubs and, and stakeholders I spoke to feel that they provided all necessary information long ago to the department in order for the department to progress sub-regional. Uh, and I would, I would hope that we can encourage the minister and the department to get a move on with this, really, to be frank. Can, 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 I, can, I, can I say, Chair, I, I, thank you for that, Andy. And many of the clubs that engaged in the process over the 10 years that we are at now have expended considerable amounts of their money in professional fees, design fees, uh, discussions with professional bodies and so on in an attempt to take this forward. And yet as a department, um, executive money agreed that we haven't expended one penny on cutting a sod, laying a foundation for the clubs that are going to be eligible for this 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 support. I mean, ten years, chair, from it was agreed, and we haven't cut a sod yet. Okay, members. Um, Andy has a proposal there, uh, along with Roman, um, around the sub-regional state area. Members happy enough that we uh, send that through to the minister to ask about that issue, and are members happy we move on to item number three, which is about Casement Park as well? Yeah. Okay. <coughs> All right, members. Item number three. Then, if you p turn to page twenty-nine, if you're meeting park or meeting pack. And there's a response from the Minister for Infrastructure in relation to Casement Park planning application. The Minister states that there's been considerable progress towards issuing a final decision. Um, officials have been working at pace to progress the required planning agreement, which must be in place before the planning, final planning decision can issue. The Departmental Solicitor's Office and the GAA's legal team remain in regular contact and both parties are keen to reach agreement as soon as possible. Um, given the required legal skills required for the drafting of the planning agreement, the Minister is satisfied that the appropriate staff complement from within the Department is involved in the planning application. Again, Members, can I ask, are there any comments on this? Are you content to note? Content? Yep. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, yep. Go ahead. Who's that? Sinead. Yes. Go ahead. Yeah. Listen. Look, I, I I note the minister's response, and I'm grateful for her for to her for the response. But I, I still maintain that four months since she made that announcement is is still is simply not acceptable. Um. And the minister for communities can't uh, realistically develop um you know the business case any further until we know what the planning conditions are going to be so i just want to reiterate my comments uh, from the last time that we really need to get a move on we need to see what the final plan and decision will say and what those conditions will be okay thank you Sinead. and i know you have brought this up on several occasions around the planning issue um thank you um sorry, go Chair, ahead mark I, yes I'm certainly not mark not sorry not i can't I, you're not on screen so I don't see you waving but you do have your hand up sorry go ahead i um <laughs> No, we, 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 we've sort of danced this dance before. Planning is, there's a statutory process that has to go through, and it's a two-way process. It involves the Department of Infrastructure and the applicant. I think the letter sort of outlines that quite well, that there's been ongoing work, and work continues between uh, both of those. I think as the earlier debate, I'll call it, uh, around casement demonstrates, the Minister's problem here the, as the Minister for Communities problem here around casement isn't the planning, and I think very much this green form has been used as a red herring. I think that's what I said a couple of weeks ago. 
uh, the, the issue here is going to be the finance. Now, the letter that we've got back from the department around casement gives us a lot more detail on the finance than the Minister for Communities was able to tell us a couple of weeks ago. She says she couldn't tell us any of this. None of this uh, could, could be done or none of it was known because there was no green form yet. We, we do know roughly, we have a ballpark park figure of what it's going to cost. The, the planning uh, will, will go ahead. I'm, I'm certainly hopeful. The work's going on. Uh, and just to, to lash out and try and point and the portion blame here, there and everywhere. It, it, it's just not the way to get this. There are going to be enough battles, Sinead, for us to get <laughs> to get this project that we both want and our parties both want very much. And, uh, you know, so pick, pick your battles. Maybe you can have a word with your minister. We, we can get a wriggle on then more. Maybe you have a word with a finance minister about the money too, Sinead, sure. Okay, okay, members. Okay, we're having one of those mornings. I don't know what's going on with this committee this morning. Okay, members, and thank you, Mark, for, for your comments as well. Are members content that I move on then? We could maybe get number four. We're only on number four, <laughs> um, squeezed in before we start our witnesses. Members happy enough with that? Yes? You're earning your corn yeah. this morning, Chair. Sure. <laughs> um, okay, members, can I ask you then turn to page 31, where you'll see a response from the Minister of Finance in, rel in relation to budget pressures. The Minister states that in producing the draft budget, the executive agreed to retain some COVID funding to allow departments time to refine their pressures. There will therefore be an opportunity for the executive to consider any further demands on the funding available when finalising the budget. Again, can I ask members, are they content with this? Are content to note or any comments? No content? Are you con Kelly, have you a comment? You're sighing. Well, um, yeah, I'm not really um, content with it. My concern is that um, this ongoing debacle. I know we've got um, a piece to do in the chamber next week on the budget, but um, a number of organisations are now putting their putting their staff onto protective notice um, because yet again we we cannot provide them with um, you know letters of offer or even an indication of what the budget will be. Um, we I think we all as parties have agreed that we need to have multi year budgets going forward, and hopefully this will be the last one. But there's there's very little we can do about this as a committee at this stage. Okay, thank you, Kelly. Any other comments? Or content? I move on. I'll try and squeeze in one more before we go to first briefing. Yeah, content. Yes. Okay, members, can I then ask you then? We'll move on to item five on this, and that's at page thirty-two. We'll you'll see a response from the Minister for Health on queries to minimum unit pricing. The minister has made the minister has made a commitment to have a full consultation on this issue once the new substance use strategy has been finalised. The strategy is expected to be launched in the spring of this year, and the consultation will examine a range of possible options in respect of alcohol pricing. I know I'd asked the Minister a, a question around um, the minimum pricing in the Chamber on Tuesday, and he had said that he had hoped that, that, at that uh, by the end of this mandate the consultation would be out on that also, but it would be the next mandate that would be bringing forward um, the minim minimum unit pricing. That's so difficult to say. Um, so, Members, are you content to note that item of business as well? Yeah, content. Yes. Okay, we're over time wise. I think we might mm -hmm. squeeze one more. Yeah. Um, we'll go then to page 34 with a response from the Minister for Finance on queries to the UK Shared Prosperity Fund. It is anticipated the fund will be worth £1.5 billion per annum. However, the Department of Finance does not as yet have any details on its allocation priorities or delivery mechanisms on either the pilot or SPF. The Minister states that Whitehall engagement and information on the fund has been severely lacking, which has prevented meaningful engagement. The Minister also states that she is actively working to secure this funding for groups in the voluntary and community sector and the wider community and continue, will continue to do so. I, I, I read that letter and find that very disappointing uh, of how our Finance Minister is not getting that information from Whitehall. Um, I certainly... Uh, Feel as a committee, we should be supporting the finance minister. Um, I would be more than happy if the committee were agreement to write ourselves through to the Westminster and um, to ask uh, that, that, that this issue um, d d be addressed. Um, because I think we've heard from various groups within this committee and evidence sessions that are very, very worried about their future and the shared prosperity fund. 
um, and how many of those great projects will, will possibly have to end. And we know that some of them had said it had taken years for those projects to, to actually get up off the ground. So members in agreement with that, that we, we write a letter of support for the Finance Minister. Um, Kelly, go ahead. I was going to say absolutely, Chair. Um, I was, if you weren't going to mention that, I was going to ask for it. Can we also perhaps add in the Secretary of State because um, it would be useful perhaps if his influence could be used to explain exactly why this is so important for Northern Ireland. Other regions of the UK may not have had um, as much benefit of European structural funding as we have had over the years. But if we find that the replacement for it coming from the from Whitehall is going to undermine the work, especially in peace building and shared society building across Northern Ireland, then we have to be, and we have to call it out as, as something's going wrong here. Um, I know and I appreciate that there will be hypothecated um, restrictions on this money when it comes here, but I do have major concerns. I think we should add in the Secretary of State as well to ask him to get in contact with Whitehall too. Okay, thanks Kelly. Robin, did you want to make a comment? Yeah, Chair, that letter was written on the 15th of February. Is there not some clarity emerging uh, as we, within the past 24 hours? I am unaware. I haven't heard anything. You maybe know, or have listened or heard something or read something. I haven't. Yeah, I, I thought so there we'll was. we'll check that. I thought there was, but, but I mean, an agreement that we should write. Okay. Seek clarity on the matter, yeah. Okay, we can double check that, but I think um, we'd certainly need to um, support the Finance Minister in this for the sake of all of those groups that have written to us and come before us in this committee. All right, members, I am going to then um, suggest that we stop at that item and we'll move then into our um, evidence gathering on the bill and then we'll come back. So I try and remember where I am, which will be doubtful. Um, so bear with me, we have flick through all of these pages. All right, okay. So then we're going to move then uh, sorry, Mark, your hand is up before I move on. Or did you want to make a comment on the last issue? No? Okay. All right, then can I ask then if all the members could be taken out of spotlight and then um, could ask uh, if Karen Smith, David Brown and Francis Burton be brought into the spotlight. Um, members, we're moving on now to agenda item number five, which is a briefing from NILGA on the licensing and registration of clubs amendment bill. You'll find this agenda item at page 93 of your meeting pack. And then can I formally welcome Karen, David and Francis to the meeting today. I think Karen, it's yourself that is going to give us a briefing. You have five to ten minutes. Um, to brief us, and then that will be followed by questions from members. So please go ahead. Um, thank you very much, Chair. If I can just maybe ask um, Councillor Francis Burton, who is leading off um, our delegation. So um, Francis will be giving the introductory statement for us. Brilliant. Thank you. Go ahead, Francis. Good morning, members. Um, Nilga welcomes the opportunity to meet with the committee this morning. Uh, and we hope that our evidence will be helpful in assisting the committee to, to develop the bill, which I hope will get over the line this time. Before we get into more detailed discussions, I should note that the outset, from the outset that the 11 councils uh, are not responsible for liquor licensing, but uh, we have a great deal of interest in this bill. Due to the close re relationship with entertainment licensing, which local government is responsible for, due to the health impacts for individuals and not least the social impacts that alcohol can cause for families and indeed localities. Nelga is keen to ensure that the bill, when passed, enables a modern and contemporary licensing system that is e easily understood and which ensures that Northern Ireland is welcoming for visitors while not making social problems worse, particularly for residential areas close to uh, licensed premises. As our high streets change and as we encourage people to move back into our towns, villages and cities, we need to ensure that our legislation does not create future unintended consequences and is developed in a way that will enable suitable licensing approaches locally. As councils, we are concerned about the potential impact of Clause 3. As we've stated in our written submission, 
and we believe that there may be a rolling back of council powers in the the tying in of entertainment licensing licensing with liquor licensing. Less than two weeks ago, we marked the 40th anniversary of the Stardust tra tragedy and must will all be aware of the importance of the entertainment license and responsibility for public safety. I would like to take the opportunity to again welcome clauses six and eight, which Nilka believes will be extremely valuable to local economies through licensing of major events, support for local producers, and by enabling retail sales at markets. The current pandemic has had a massive impact on local small businesses, and we believe that this legislation is developed in the right if developed in the right way, can be a means to recovery for what has been a hugely impacted sector. This will also be particularly important for small pubs covered by Clause 4 of the Bill. We know that a discussion in relation to the issues surrounding business hours and closing times will be necessary, and of course we acknowledge the importance of Easter and the significance of change to many people. Nilga is happy to discuss the clauses of the bill with the committee, particularly those related to young people, and we believe that there is a need to ensure that the department keeps licensing requirements under regular review to meet the needs of our rapidly changing society, technology and our entrepreneurs. We are keen to ensure that as evidence-based approach is taken to the development of legislation and wish the committee well as it endeavours, which may require some research on licensing law in the countries where the largest number of our visitors originate and on relevant, relevant emerging technologies and innovations. Chair, I'm aware that we've been requested to provide only a short introduction to enable more time for committee questions and discussions. So I'll stop there, David and Karen, and I will answer you. Sorry, David, Karen, and I will answer uh, as best we can any questions. Uh, I trust our comments will add value to your considerations. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Francis. And um, for many of us here in, in this committee, um, sat on councils for a number of years. And I remember certainly um, issues around. Um, <laughs> antisocial behaviour and licensing and entertainment and all of those things and the various uh, trials um, that that uh, had set whenever I was on council. So a wee bit, I want, I'm a bit interested on in maybe looking at this clause three a bit more on just how you feel this will have the, 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 the entertainment's licence tied to the liquor licence. Just give some examples maybe, Francis, to the committee um, of just how you see this um, affecting you in your role uh, as councillors. Um, Chair, if I can maybe suggest that David Brown, who's the, the Chair of the Institute of Licensing in Northern Ireland, uh, might be best placed to answer that, that query um, on behalf of Nilga, if that's okay. Absolutely, go ahead. Uh, yes, Chairman, um, I, I think it will sort of handicap the councils to the degree and how they do um, license and regulate premises, particularly at night. Um, the, there have been problems, I think, throughout across the problems at the moment with um, late night licenses running maybe to two or three in the morning with, without alcohol and possibly causing problems for the police. But I do think it, it, it will very much limit what the council can do to try and alleviate the problems for, for people in, in the local areas. Because I think the council is really the best place to deal with complaints and problems around late night activities. Okay. Um, can you give an, a, an example of any kind, just to help the committee, to, just to, to see this in their mind's eye, of where you would see that, you know, where, how a problem would arise? Well, I think the kinds of, I mean, I mean there's some places, um, sorry, maybe speaking from my own area, you know, we have hotels, so we had a hotel outside the, the borough, which we did allow to operate at three in the morning. Um, it did allow then, you know, for this 
we, we've been talking in other parts of the legislation about dispersing people and giving them a longer time to, to be on the premises before you know so that they don't all go out at once. So the premises were able to operate on for a time, allowed to serve tea and coffee, etc. After after the drinking and, and disperse slowly. But possibly within the towns, uh, we, we would never have allowed a late night license like that because of the activities and the, and the, the, the disruption that it would cause to, to local residents. But I think councils are better placed to, to, to deal with it, to, to look at those issues. I suppose you're, you're absolutely right. Um, councils and councillors are very much live within their communities and work within their communities and, and yeah. actually know where the hot spots are and know where the problems are. So that's is that that's where the angle you would be coming from there, I assume then, yeah? It is, yes. I think I think we are better placed. And also it's probably, you know, to deal with a problem I think it's quicker for the councils to deal with that through the licensing so our licensing system than to have to maybe uh, to go to back to court to deal, for the courts to deal with those problems, which is expensive. And I think the general public don't particularly like to go to court to maybe get a, a late night license or licenses, um, you know, put, put an objection into those through the court system rather than our system. Okay, look, thank you for that. I'm going to then just ask you on uh, the other issue that Francis had highlighted there as well, about the age limit and, or, and at specified underage functions. Um, do you have a view on what that you you made comment about a lower age limit um, in your submission? Have you any or idea of what you would see that lower age limit to be? Do you want to um, do it? Sorry, sorry, Chair. Maybe if, if I could come in on that, but um, certainly the the um, whenever we looked at the the bill um, proposals, um, it seemed to us that. Um, it was very much geared towards teenage events, um, and I suppose really it's, it's just to, to um, allow clarity for licensing officers in relation to the age of, of, of uh, children who would be allowed to be at those events. Um, and I mean, really, um, I suppose whenever you're looking at like, younger children, you may be more talking about the family type events like weddings or christenings or whatever. And certainly, the, the main concern um, that was expressed um, to us was. Um, really, in relation to the, the young people's events, particularly that whenever they get to a later stage of the, of the night, um, that there's a danger when, um, if everybody is, is released into the street together, there's a danger for um, young uh, people mixing with, with um, older people, uh, with, with adults who have been drinking. Um, and also, um, really, the, the, the consideration is that um, we were very supportive um, of the, uh, the, the there's clauses in the bill which um, require parental supervision of younger children as well. So it's, it's really just to make sure that there's clarity um, and, and that sort of cut-off point um, to, um, I suppose, support teenagers who want to, to have uh, events uh, in, in um, grown-up premises, but not, uh, to protect their, the much younger children as well. Yeah, and I suppose that, that issue actually hasn't been highlighted with us as yet, um, and it, it, you make a good point there, where you do have an underage function that is possibly finishing at the same time as other events or functions or general drinking in a bar of a premises, and everybody's spilling out onto the street together. Um, and I know you'd create the 1am finish for underage functions. Um, do, would you have a view then that, that that should be set at a different time? Um, Chair, I think it's, it's back to that um, local flexibility and what's um, appropriate in particular areas. Um, and I think that, that, that uh, David has made the point about um, the, the fact that councils have maybe greater flexibility than the, the regional court system um, we have in, in relation to that kind of decision making. And there will be areas where uh, it will be um, suitable um, for, for uh, underage um events to be run in a certain way and other areas where, where it wouldn't be. But maybe, David, if you want to um, come in on that, that would be helpful. Sorry, on the, on the, the question of, of underage? Yes. Um, yeah, I mean, underage discos have always been a, a, an issue, I think. Um, certainly from my experience over the years, they, 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 they have been problematic because of the lack of uh, control of those discos and, and, and uh, putting proper measures in place for them. So I think any, any legislation that, that, that the Assembly does bring forward certainly needs to look very carefully at how those, that there's greater controls put on um, those types of functions. 
Um, and certainly um, that there should be a distinction, I think, made between the, 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 those types of functions in licensed premises and a normal disco. So there is a, there is a distinction there. But um, certainly, it certainly needs to be good at guidance for the council. If we are going to have these you know, discos that, that we can control and monitor them to, to a greater degree. Okay, look, thank you. Both of you made some good points there. I'm going to open up for members. I have Kelly and then I have Robin. So can any other members please um, signify if they want to come in? Um, Kelly, can I go to you? Thank you very much, Chair. Um, Thank you very much, um, all, for your for your presentation today. Um, I'm just actually just what, as you guys have been speaking there. I have other questions, but I'm just thinking: Do we need to be clear on the, the council's enforcement powers? Then do there need to be more clarification, or do they need to be strengthened? Um, where councils will have responsibility for licensing, and there are abusers of that. I've met with um, some people outside of of the committee just to ask questions about this joining up of the the alcohol licensing with the entertainment's licensing and it is causing some concern but do you think then in order to manage that that the council would need to have more enforcement because there is concern out there that there are a number of venues who flout the rules and nothing seems to be done about them there is things being done about them of course but people just don't see enough being done would you rather that the council had more enforcement powers instead of going to court um, so I'll, I'll answer. Uh, from my point of view, th there's a distinction between what the police can do and what the, what the councillors can do. I think both parties know what they can do, but um, I think both have to be very proactive in how they take forward those those, those issues. So whereas at the moment councils are, are granting entertainment licences maybe to two three in the morning, um, they, they only control the ent the entertainment within that premise and the safety of the people within that premise. But they're not controlling people consuming alcohol or maybe an underage drinking or, or all the rest of it. That's a police issue. So whether or not there needs to be a movement that the council will be getting more powers to deal with that, I don't know. But our role is safety and, and noise disturbance. And I know the police have a role in that too. But there is a sometimes there's a mismatch. mismatch. I know certainly in my own area and, and over the years we, we work very closely with the police and tried to align those, those 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 issues. There's also I think within both parties need to know what the other party can do. The police need to know what the council can do and, and a council and we need to work in tandem and those powers need to certainly be strengthened and looked up. Yeah, but uh, probably the, the public would be the third wheel of or third spoke of that wheel to make sure yeah. that they know who's responsible. That's brilliant. Thank you. Um, I just want to ask a few questions about your um, submission. So um, when you talk about local producers, um, you've talked about being very comfortable with that local producers license being extended to allow um, drinks to be purchased, to be consumed off premises. Um, now we're not particularly interested in local producers selling on premises in a tap room type function. Um, Chair, if I can maybe just come in um, and the, the written submission that we've provided, um, we have um, where it said that we're strongly supportive of the clause which enables local producers of alcoholic drinks to sell direct to visitors from their manufacturing premises. So I meant that as to actually sell on premises and, and then have a go on. To, to say about for and for, consu for consumption off the premises as well, and um, so oh, it's maybe it's maybe I have maybe phrased it badly. Um, certainly, um, I don't think that there was an issue with um, the tap room um, idea at all. I, I think that that, that is uh, we would support that. Oh, brilliant. No, it's just because I know so many councils have been wonderful with local producers of, of all types of drinks and, and produce um, and promoting that, that food and drink, you know, as a tourist destination. Um, the other thing I wanted to ask you about, and it's a very pertinent point, actually, you brought up, um, and I think you're probably the only group that has when you talk about online orders and deliveries um, to people. And it's where the order um, comes from outside of Northern Ireland, how that can be controlled. And you've mentioned the about the delivery companies would have to take responsibility on that. Um, I just thank you very much for raising that because it is something that we need to be concerned about. So somebody could have a delivery of wine or a spirit or, you know, it could be a very expensive bottle of whiskey, for instance, and that could be arriving from Scotland, it could be arriving from America, it could be arriving from anywhere. Um, but how do we control that? So you think that there should be something perhaps there about the delivery um, people? I, I think, um, Chair, through you, um, there, there was a conversation we had. I, I had with some of the, the entertainment licensing officers in um, 
um, local government and it was an issue that was, was raised about the age um, specification of delivery drivers because um, if you are a delivery um, agent, potentially you could be out doing a motorcycle delivery from 16 years old and you can be driving from 17 years old and it's, it's really just to make sure that people who are de delivering um, alcoholic drinks are over 18 um, and it's because and I'm saying that um, it's, it's more likely um, in relation to um, deliveries from um, further afield that it would be done in a larger vehicle which is more likely to be driven by an older person but it's just to be aware that there is a, a potential um, there for uh, uh, an anomaly um, if we don't have this um, drafted properly. Okay. Um, the Chair's already asked about the lower age limits, so that's been answered. Um, your issues about the technology, I know that we've had this raised as well from retail, and I think it was, that brought it forward, that we don't close the door on future potential technologies um, may require an amendment. I'm just thinking, um, is there anything that, that you could suggest? Because we are, we are quite keen to prevent vending machines, but I know that you've raised quite a number of options that, that would be available, including the robots, which is an interesting one. But um, I'm just thinking, is that what you want us to be able to leave as flexible as possible to allow the door to open then through the legislation for future technology? Um, Chair, through you, I, I'm just aware that this is really complicated legislation. It's hard for people to understand as it is. And I mean, one of the things that we would be very keen to make sure is that, that that sort of collaborative approach that David was talking about between the police and the councils um, and the licensees and you know, police and community safety partnerships and just in the round locally, that um, there's an understanding and developing public understanding of what is required and what they're allowed to do and what they're not allowed to do. Um, I think that and whenever you introduce a new technology, um, it, 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 it's difficult for legislation to keep up. And it may be that um, there's, a, a, there's some way of having a, 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 an ability to introduce secondary legislation to um, at a later stage to, to um, deal with um, innovation. I'm, I'm not sure whether it's possible to add into legislation at all because you're trying to preempt something that doesn't exist yet, possibly. Yeah. Um, but it's just you know to be aware that you know, there is um, a, a move to um, try to ensure that Northern Ireland is modern and contemporary, is embracing innovation and, and new technology. And we, what we don't want is for businesses and hotels and retail here to suffer from legislation that's going to take a while to keep up. You know, so it, it's trying to, to preempt that. I'm not sure how that would be done. No problem. My final question, I just wanted to ask your advice because the point that you raised earlier about young people from underage functions coming out at the same time as adults who have had who've consumed al alcohol, possibly from the same premises, because the underage function could be in a function room, mm. at the bar in another part. Um, I'm just thinking about the drinking up time. So drinking up time can be extended to 60 minutes. Um, I'm just thinking if the time that young people were coming out of an underage function set was one o'clock. But because they're not drinking alcohol and alcohol isn't hasn't been you know provided in that for that function, um, do they need a drinking up time? You know, obviously we need time for young people to be picked up. Um, should we prevent that? You know, should, would you think that thirty minutes would be plenty of time to allow those young people to be picked up and taken away from that venue, um, so that it, the drinking up time doesn't really apply? That extended drinking up time doesn't apply then to underage functions. Uh, that certainly would seem to make sense, David. Do you have any comments on that? It wouldn't apply. I mean, the drinking up time is really the drinking up time. It's allow you to consume alcohol after after the, the bars are closed. So that if it's under age, no alcohol, it shouldn't shouldn't be a, you know, it shouldn't be an issue. Yeah, thank you. you no, know, I think it's it's an interesting point because if we are going to differentiate or we're considering differentiating, mm -hmm. um, the drinking up time shouldn't be you know taken into consideration we want to make sure the health and safety of those young people when they're leaving you know a premises is certainly looked after so that they are able to be picked up safely but drinking up time to me doesn't seem to apply um in those underage functions uh, it's, it's, it's an important consideration chair for you that uh, and, and it also ties in with what we're saying about staggering um sort of closing times and, and particularly in uh, in more urban areas like Belfast, where um, there's a tendency for everybody to, to close at the same time, and everybody to spill, spill out under the streets, no taxis available, available, and they can't get home. So it's trying to um, locally have that sort of place-based approach to 
deciding what mm. uh, with, with the industry what should happen uh, in that local area and what's appropriate and to make sure that we cause as, li as little nuisance to residents uh, as possible and um, because obviously we are trying to um, bring uh, residents back into urban centers um, post troubles um, to um, make it a more 24-hour society uh, to a certain extent but that and, you know brings us own problems and this is one of the issues that needs uh, proper consideration. Thank you very much, folks. And David, nice to see you again. Um, I was in the council at one stage, but um, <laughs> thank you very much. That has answered a lot of my questions. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Okay. Thanks, Kelly. I have Robin and then Karen. So, Robin. Uh, thank you, Chair. And I welcome Karen, David and Councillor Burton uh, to the meeting. I think NILGA uh, as an important uh, body. I think it's uh, right that we very much take uh, note of your concerns. But I suppose, by and large, you're supportive of anticipated changes in, in the, the legislation. Um, but I, I'd like maybe if you could just expand on um, one sentence uh, within your uh, submission. I think it was raised by Councillor Burton, um, and it doesn't matter who, who responds to it, but uh, I'll just read it out. NILGA is supportive of the need to achieve desired change in consumer behaviour and to provide an attractive alternative to home drinking and amenities, amenities for visitors. But we are also aware that many pubs are on streets with large number of residents who may negatively uh, be impacted by noise and potential antisocial behaviour from some pub customers. Maybe um, whoever... Uh, would like to perhaps expand on your thinking uh, within the document in that area? Can I maybe come in, Robin, on that? Um, I suppose uh, if you're looking at uh, an urban area, one of the uh, issues we would have in Mid Ulster, um, and I'm a member of the Policing and Community Safety Partnership, and we have a nighttime economy group within that. And um, one of the issues would be um, where uh, young people have hired a bus and are preloading um, before they get to some of these venues. And that has caused problems from right from when they arrive, both in terms of uh, the premises having to, to deal with young people who are actually already drunk or well, you know, well on before they even arrive. And um, in the previous uh, comments where um, everyone gets out at the one time, we've also had um, young people who have went from the urban town and say, for example, if McDonald's or whatever is way on down the street and obviously it's open uh, 24 hours back in the day when we were all open. Um, and, you know, there has been antisocial behaviour with pots of uh, gardens, flower pots being pulled out and um, you know there has been some abusive behaviour even in terms of people um, and just the normal antisocial behaviour where it's shouting and people who are obviously in bed at that time with young people or with children and um, we've had quite a lot of people who have come in and made objections to that so as a PCSP, we have brought on um, people, or sorry, uh, bus providers, you know, to try and engage with that uh, sector as well, to try and alleviate. So I think that's one of the things that we would really like looked at in, uh, and I note it's right at the conclusion on page 10 um, in relation to preloading uh, where the, where the transport system. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Um, all right. Uh, those, okay. I, I'm I'm content if no one else wants to make a comment. Anybody else want to make a comment on that or content? You all right. No, okay. I, thank you. All right. Okay. Thanks, Robin. Um, I'll move on then. We've got Karen and then we've got Mark. So can we bring Karen in? Thank you, Chair, and thank you, uh, Francis, David, and Charm. Just coming in on that, it was just on the section at the end on missed opportunities. 
Uh, and I know Francis, you've just finished off there. Just you talked about no legislation being in place to stop on board um, drinking on, on buses um, uh, when, when people are attending events. But also, I found it really interesting. He's raised a really good point around party buses and taxis, which we see in some cities. We don't have them at all. But uh, they were when we were out and about and allowed to celebrate stuff, you know, um, they were, were they were being used more. Um, so just really to see if you would like to see both of those included in a new clause, um, or would you like to elaborate a bit more? Thank you. Um, I think, Chair, for you, the, these were issues that were raised um, with the, your, the, the, the then committee, um, that, that I think that we would ask him to in, in 2017, um, and certainly. Um, the party bus um, issue um, was was raised at that stage, and I'm not sure that it's one of those issues that it's quite going to be quite difficult to deal with. I would really like to see. I think Milda would really like to see um, uh, something going into the legislation about this in relation to the preloading on transport that uh, Francis has already developed a, 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 a piece on and has, has spoken about um, earlier on there. Um, I'm not sure whether that is something that um, can be included in this licensing legislation. It may be something that needs to be done through DFI, um, and it may be something that, that this committee would like to, to speak to the infrastructure committee about, because in relation to public transport, they've obviously got responsibility for that. And um, the difficulty has been that um, the uh, legislation about um, the Class A events um, and sort of pre-drinking uh, in relation to football events and so forth was done whenever um, Department for Environment was still in place, and now that the sort of uh, the functions have been separated between um, uh, DFC and DFI, um, that it, it's, it'll be interesting to see um, which um, uh, department, which committee would need to to approve legislation on that. It, it would be good to see because I mean certainly um, Francis um, has had recent conversations with the, the community safety partnership officer in Mid Ulster, and it's still an issue, I think, in, in good time, Francis. Yeah. So um, it, it's happening in, in, in various centres, bringing in um, young people from rural areas into sort of into, into towns, county towns, and I think it's something that needs to be um, addressed in some way. If I yeah. can add, maybe. Um, uh, one of the issues would be that sometimes young people meet up at college and they leave on the you know on the party bus with a friend and they, they may not really know well the town that they're then going to. So if they arrive intoxicated um, and the friend goes off with someone else or goes on into the establishment, we have found that. Um, some we've actually had to bring on like street angels they're called in Cookstown where they have worked with um, some of the venues to try and ensure that whenever these type of incidents happen that that young person is not just le left on the street abandoned because we've found at times that the, you know there is young people who are actually left on the road you know which is obviously a, a danger for them in, in all time types of they could be attacked or assaulted or whatever. And the other thing is, um, we have actually had, from the PCSP's point of view, um, the guys who are the bus drivers are saying, you know, these, these young people don't listen to us. We are trying to watch the road and where we're driving. We do not have the power to take the alcohol off them. We, you know, you ask them to sit down poli politely. Sometimes they do, sometimes they don't. So it can be a real distraction to the bus driver as well, you know. So it brings up all kinds of antisocial behaviour because also then sometimes they want the bus stopped and that brings urination into um, villages and real all all kinds of unpleasant happening happenings. So you know, if if you could take a look at that, I think we would really welcome that um, something is done on that. I, th I think it is it is a separate issue, though, um, uh, um, Chair, about the, the party buses, because, I mean, certainly there are repurposed fire engines, there are um, people carriers that whenever you open them, they're, they're, they're all disco lights and music inside, and I mean, obviously they're, they're, they're designed and, and created specifically to have a party in the vehicle. 
Um, and it's just that, that there is a, a real grey area there because there's no control over that at all. Yeah. <laughs> I agree, Sharon and Francis. Um, I suppose I wouldn't be over the detail either. I'm not sure if DFI are looking at it. It, it is something that we need to look at. Um, uh, because she's make very good points there. You no, know, even what Francis was saying, there's a lot of responsibility there on the bus driver, mm -hmm. and a lot of potential dangers there for um the users and particularly young people who don't see any danger whatsoever. Mm -hmm. So, um, no, I thank you for including that in the briefing. Um, and it's hopefully someone will follow up as a committee. Thank you very much. That's me, Chair. Okay, thank you. Thanks for bringing that up, Karen. I know I did hear some comment about that in the chamber on Monday or Tuesday. I don't know whether it was at one of the question times um, about drinking on, well, drinking on public transport on buses and things like that. I know the party buses are slightly different, so we could maybe get a wee bit more information on that. Um, so thanks for bringing that up, Karen. Um, I love only one more member that wants to ask questions, and that is Mark. So can we bring Mark in? Uh, thank you, Chair, and thanks to the team for Nelga for coming on and for their submission. I'd be going to come on, on, on the, the bus issue. Uh, hopeful maybe that Nelga might have some <laughs> proposed solutions because it is a pretty complex issue. It's one, as Karen has says there, it's one that I actually remember grappling with when I was in the Department of, of Environment. So there's DFI with potential responsibility, DFC, but then there were also, I, I remember health getting involved at one point and, and justice as well. It, 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 it is pretty complex. I don't know if we're going to sort it out here today or in this legislation, but it definitely is something uh, that we need to come together on. Uh, it, it, it's difficult, it's complex. You know, I remember at one stage someone coming forward with a proposal that you just ban alcohol on buses, but th th that can't be done either because that would apply just as much to the, 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 the man or woman who'd been to Marks and Spencer's and got their shopping, got a meal deal that included a bottle of wine and jumping on a bus to go home. <laughs> they, they'd be breaching that as well. It, it's, it, it's difficult, all right. But just, uh, and we'll move on from the buses. I think we'll be hearing shortly about the phenomenon of roadside pints, which cropped up during the lockdown, whereby licensees were providing alcohol from vans or, or, or vehicles to customers' homes. Now, this may have been a pandem pandemic-related uh, phenomenon just in, in the end, when we can all get out of our houses and the pubs again, but it could also be part of a wider societal shift to home deliveries and businesses adopting accordingly. I was just wondering, did Nelga foresee any problems with this? Um, Chair, there's a couple of different issues there. I mean, there's one in relation to we've already touched on about the delivery drivers and making sure that they are in, in the right age bracket. Um, but I mean, really, um, the, the part of the issue for getting the licensing regulations right and licensing and legislation right is to try to deter uh, people from sitting in the house alone and drinking a huge amount of alcohol. I mean, it's, it's essentially to try to get the, uh, people out in the pubs and creating a more social culture um, that is a responsible drinking culture. Um, and I think that, I mean, certainly I know that there was a, a premises near me who was delivering um, draft pints um, at the roadside um, during the, the lockdown. I'm, I'm not sure whether that's still continuing, um, but you know, it was, it was seen to be a service to people who weren't able to get to the pub, you know, so it's, it's um, as I said, about innovation, people will look at uh, and, and will be entrepreneurial, and we need to encourage people to be entrepreneurial, but in the right way. Um, so th there are a number of issues there that need to be um, taken into consideration, um, and I'm not sure that uh, it, it's, it's, that those aspects are going to be solved um, within um, this this legislation. But certainly, um, it's, it's something that we need to, to take into consideration whether or not there's a limit to. The amount of alcohol that is a, that an ind individual is able to purchase from a, a in that delivery context, but then that's that's le leading into difficulties with individual freedoms, and um, you know it's it's maybe allowing things to happen in su from supermarkets where people can go and get alcohol themselves, um, and and sort of causing difficulties for smaller um, retailers. You know, so it's, there's a lot of considerations that would need to be really looked at. Okay, uh, thank you, Karen. That's, that's me, Chair. That'll do for today. Thank you.
Okay, Mark, thank you, and thank you again for highlighting some issues as well that um, would, haven't been highlighted. Um, members, no one else wants to make comment or query at this stage. Look, can I thank you, Francis, Karen and David, um, and Nilga in general, um, for <coughs> certainly for the, the submission that you put in, but also for coming and briefing us here on the committee today. You've certainly highlighted some issues um, that haven't been highlighted before, which is great. And um, certainly, um, your your input has been invaluable. So thank you very much for joining us. Oh, sorry, Kelly, did you want to come back in again? Your hands up. Uh, sorry, yes, Chair. I just wanted to say um, when when I received this paperwork on behalf, you know, from the the guys, I had a wee bit of a, an investigation. Um, when Mark was minister, I have to declare an interest and say that I was on the alcohol on buses working group um, with the DOD at that stage, or that he was with the Department of the Environment. Um, the Justice Act 2011 already prevents anybody from travelling on a coach to sports matches and consume alcohol in the bus. Um, Mark has raised the issue. It's PSV licensing um, that is the mechanism through DFI. Uh, PSV is the public service vehicle licensing. And as, as some have raised there, the problem is that when a driver is at the front of a vehicle, how do they see? They can't have eyes in the back of their head. How do they see when they're driving safely if anybody is actually drinking? So the only way to do that is to prevent opened um, you know, bottles or cans or whatever it is on the buses. Um, so the preloading is a massive issue. I think um, we've mentioned it before, Chair, if we could write to the Department of Infrastructure just to ask for an update on their proposals for PSV licensing and alcohol on vehicles. Um, it might be useful as well if we could get a copy of the relevant part of the Justice Act shared around everyone, um, just so that everyone's aware of that um, connection with the sporting matches. Thank you for that, and uh, thank you. We'll action that as well. Um, okay. Well, oh, my screen's gone off. No, it's back again. Um, as I was saying earlier, Francis, um, Karen, and David, thank you very much for coming in front of committee today. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Bye. Thank you. All right, um, members. Can I just uh, take a quick break here? Do we see if we can get our computer system up and running again? Um, we know we have uh, Mark from the PSNI is waiting to come in, um, so we'll be with you very shortly. If just take a small break. This is the Northern Ireland. Okay, members, we're going to move on then to agenda item <coughs> six, which is PSNI briefing on the licensing and registration of clubs amendment bill. Also. You'll find this agenda item at page 105 of your meeting pack. And can I then welcome ACC Mark McEwen to the meeting. Mark, you're very welcome today. Um, you have five to ten minutes to do an opening brief. Um, don't feel you need to use all of that time if you, if you don't want to, um, because it will allow more time for members to ask questions. So, Mark, can you please go ahead? Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, can you hear me okay, Chair? Yep. Can indeed, yes. Okay, thank you. Um, well, first of all, thank you very much for the opportunity. Um, we really welcome the review. We're very keen to, to help and play our part in bringing um, licensing legislation up to date. And I think what's really important here is providing clarity for the public, um, for businesses and for ourselves and, and other enforcement agencies. Legislation is, is clearly a key aspect of enabling businesses uh, to thrive, to enable a, a thriving nighttime economy and ensuring people are able to enjoy themselves and, and are kept safe. It is, it is one aspect of that. It's, it's, it's obviously the most important, um, but there, uh, as, as members are aware, there are other elements to that in terms of how we manage events and how we actually manage these things on the ground. And sometimes legislation can have unintended consequences, so um, we really welcome the amount of consultation and thought going into this. Um, uh, of course, we, we want to play our part in enabling that thriving nighttime economy and, and people to be able to enjoy themselves, um, balancing that with the needs of, of, of other businesses in, in various areas and, and the rights of people to enjoy their home. Um, we're very keen to work collaboratively both through this process and in the uh, joint inspections that we carry out with councils. We hope to see that continue. And indeed, through coronavirus, uh, for the first time, we had representatives of the Department for Communities um, out on those inspections with us, and we found that really helpful and, and informative. Um, and I think working in that collaborative way enables us to, 
to create that environment we've talked about and to deal with those who, who step outside of that and, and who put people at risk. Um, just working through, uh, I'm quite happy to run through the, the sort of clauses that we uh, and think are, are of particular importance to ourselves and, and um, uh, as part of this review and, um, and give a, a quick view of it and then take questions. Um, so in terms of the, I think it's clause two, the shift from um, Article 44 and Article 44A, the change of up to 104 times per year, and the ability for licensees to apply through the court um, for an extension. Um, that generally applies to, to weekends and in terms of a policing footprint uh, and our variable shift pattern, we would be able to absorb that without too much uh, concern. So, um, uh, and because it's done through the court, it allows for that local consultation, uh, checks and balances, so we're quite, uh, quite relaxed with that one. Um, clause 3, the alignment for uh, closing time uh, for liquor and entertainment. Um, again, we're supportive of that. We think that provides the clarity for, for uh, customers, uh, for businesses and, and ourselves. And so that's very welcome. Clause 4, um, the, the uh, proposal to increase um, our Article 45 applications from 20 to 85 times a year. Um, we have done some research on this. Of those premises across Northern Ireland who have the ability to apply for up to 20, none of them have actually availed of that. Um, and that's um, not just in the last year because of coronavirus, coronavirus but previous to that. Um, it, it doesn't, in, in, in effect, pose us any real concerns, but what it would do is have an impact on resourcing for police in terms of the administration of it, if it were, if it were to be taken up. Um, but probably more importantly, it would have a, an impact on resourcing on the ground because unlike the previous element with, which fits with our variable shift pattern, this wouldn't. And it tends to apply to, I suppose, what would be classed as more rural pubs um, where we wouldn't have that nighttime economy if it can be present. So that, that would cause us some concerns. Um, in terms of Clause 6, the major events uh, issue uh, and the, the department's role as potentially administering that. Um, again, it's not really for, for police to, to comment on, on who does the administration of it. Um, it would normally be done by the court. We would like to see the detail on what the consultation process would be like around gr granting of those licences. How does that how is that balanced with other businesses and, and uh, other residential areas in whatever area it might be? What are the parameters, the procedures, and the sort of appeal mechanisms and indeed the inspection regime around that? And who would be the final arbiter? All of those things I think need to be ironed out um, before, before we could uh, collectively, I think, come to, to a, a view on it. Um, the, so, some, of, some of the bigger issues that that are very welcomed by ourselves and I think by the hospitality industry. Um, the underage functions um, largely affect things like school formals. Uh, Clause 11, which proposes to, to come up with a solution to allow those to go ahead in a, in a safe in a safe uh, and controlled manner, I think is very welcomed by ourselves. Um, I know that it has been a loss to the hospitality industry. Uh, and frankly, when we have young people uh, being able to enjoy themselves in that sort of controlled environment, it's much safer than if the, the alternative, which is often they, they're quite innovative and come up with, with solutions themselves. So um, we welcome that, um, as we do Clause 12, which clarifies the law just in terms of young people being present at, at functions, and I suppose weddings are the most, uh, the one that springs to mind as, as the clearest sort of um, example of that. Uh, again, Clause 13, just clarity on uh, delivery of intoxicating liquor to young persons being, being outlawed is, is welcome. And the policing of it is a, is a very different matter um, in terms of how and who does that, but, but it's, it's welcome nonetheless. Um, the occasional licences, um, Clause 18, the ability, the proposal of police can apply to put conditions 
um, such as uh, specific areas for under 18s, not uh, to have an alcohol free area for events and concerts. Um, again, that, that's very welcome and we think helps with just keeping young people safe. Um, so in, in essence, those, those are the main, the main aspects of this um, for us. The, the you know, Clause 22 the sporting clubs, we have no objections to that. Um, and, and, and many of the others are, are, are sort of um, probably lower down the list. So uh, I'm keen to, to allow people to, to have questions and, a, and a, a good dialogue in this. So I'll probably just leave my opening remarks there, Chair. Okay, Mark, thank you. Thanks very much for that, and thank you for your submission as well. Um, Mark, I suppose this, is a, this actually would have been a very interesting for the committee, um, had we been in normal times, to actually have spent some time with their local um, uh, police officers uh, at night. Uh, I'm someone who, who um, is a, a Belfast MLA, but also someone who served as a police officer for 10 years and rem in Belfast, and remembers very well um, way back then, you're talking some time ago, you're talking 30 years ago, um, just uh, the, the pressures that, that the police were under when it came to that sort of 1am time frame and uh, getting called all over the place because of, of various antisocial behaviour. And actually quite a lot of it was more to do with very vulnerable people actually that needed help rather than the antisocial behaviour. So it would have been really quite good for the committee to be able to spend some time yourselves um, at our nighttime economy, but sadly with COVID that's not doable. Um, I, I just want to pick up on it, just a couple of points. Um, you had said there, from what I, you'd said, that the PNS, PSNI, you believe, do you have the resources um, to cope with the increased demand, um, whether that is the, uh, the, the occasional licences or the um, drinking up time, and, and that is good to hear that from you. I just want to then just ask you, you'd said there about, you'd stated in your, in your uh, submission about um, the introductory of, a, of the one-year trial period, and you would, su would support that one-year trial period. Now, we know that it's not um, uh, within the bill, uh, it's not written within the bill that that must take place. Do you think that that needs to be included in the bill, then, that we look at that? I know it's been brought up by other people as well. Yes, Chair, I think, I mean, it's interesting when you say the pressure that comes at 1 a.m. We're kicking out time, if you like. Um, I, I, we think that the one hour um, drinking up time would alleviate that somewhat and, and just allow for a better flow. As I mentioned at the outset, there, there are other aspects to the implementation of this to create a safe environment. So the transport infrastructure needs to be right. Uh, so night buses, taxi ranks, um, and the marshalling of those taxi ranks, all those layers of control that uh, collectively we can put in to ensure people's safety, I think are very important. Um, and I think, yes, having a one-year trial period allows us to review, see if it has achieved the, the objectives we want, which is actually you know, less nuisance, less antisocial behaviour and, and less assaults and things like that. Um, and, and then per perhaps review it and, and come back to it, I think would be, would be just a useful tool for all of us. Yeah, again, I'm old enough to remember whenever, um, when I was in my 20s, uh, there was a 24-hour bus service. I remember many times getting the bus home from the city centre, and bus drivers were absolutely fantastic, especially with the females. They nearly left you off at your front door rather than at a bus stop, you know, to be walking. Um, so I do remember that, and I remember it, it did work very well then. Um, so I, I do think certainly you're absolutely right. Um, our transport infrastructure does not support quite often our nighttime economy. Um, when you have, I, I know certainly the last time I was in Belfast a few years ago, um, had to try and get a taxi home. I think we had to wait to 3 a.m. to get a taxi uh, back home and sort of just started walking at that stage along the road. And okay, I was, I, I was, there was a group of us, so I wasn't alone. But we have heard of many people um, who, who do walk home from Belfast on their own. Um, I've heard of people who have walked up motorways, who walk along the West Link. Um, I know someone who was killed on the West Link um, doing that a few, uh, several years ago. So uh, that's certainly an issue that we do need to pick up on. Our, it's not for this bill, but it's certainly an issue that um, uh, that needs to be addressed. Um, I just then want to go to the uh, issue around our our local producers, and I know that you're in favour of the of, of the producers' license and for them to be allowed to, to sell their product on site, sealed in containers or bottles. Um, the committee have heard from many. Um, witness sessions uh, for and against the issue of tap rooms. I have to say, probably we have heard more in favour of this than against 
process. Um, just what would the, be the PSNI's view on on the operation of tap rooms? So the operation of tap rooms, I suppose, our concern would be it has the effect of creating um, quite a number of other licensed premises, potentially in, in rural premises or rural parts of the country where we don't, it's a bit like the the Article 45 being opened up to those who have an Article 44. Um, it, it, it creates a demand that isn't currently there, which we are not, uh, we don't have a policing footprint to deal with. Should it create things like antisocial behaviour or just noise and the need to, to have a policing presence at it? Um, I'm not suggesting we're going to become um, major issues around them, but, but they, should, should they require policing uh, response, then they will be in areas that potentially we don't necessarily um, uh, have the resource footprint for that at this time. So we would have to work our way through that. That would be our main concern around it. I suppose, I mean, we've heard from many of those uh, breweries and distilleries and, and also a cidery uh, who incidentally don't, don't want the tap room, but others that do, and that say that people actually don't go to a tap room to sit all night and um, they don't preload before they go and all of those other issues that we have on many of our, our, our bars and, and clubs in Belfast and, our, and throughout Northern Ireland. Um, but I suppose then you're looking at unintended consequences then of what may happen in the future. Is that where you're coming from? Yes, and, and I think with, I mean, I do, I do take the point that um, it's not the sort of place where generally people go um, f for for an elongated um, time and, and preloading and all those issues. It's, I suppose, the unintended consequence. And as with all of these things, we have a huge amount of very responsible business owners uh, in, in the hospitality industry here. Um, and it's trying to foresee what might come with um, with with some unintended consequences of people who try to abuse or stretch the legislation. Okay, Mark, that's um, me for now. I've got a few members. I have Alex, Kelly, Karen, and then Robin. So can I go to Alex first? Yeah, hi, Mark. Good to see you. I haven't seen you in a long time. That's fine. <laughs> I've noticed um, in the comments on 3A on your presentation, and thank you for the presentation, what was the impact do you think it would have on alcohol consumption and your view or your piece of view is it's likely to significantly increase alcohol consumption? Um, do you think that would cause significant problems for your police officers to have to deal with consequences of that? Uh, and it, this is in reference to clause three. Yeah, yeah. Honestly, yeah, in terms of, um, I, I, I think, I, I think actually we, we would welcome the aligning of entertainment and, and alcohol. Um, it may have the impact if um, it is extended in terms of alcohol uh, licensing times of increased. Uh, consumption, but I think a bit like the drinking up time in the trial period, we haven't asked for a trial period for this um, because we do think it provides clarity. But what we've seen in other places is that the additional time actually evens out the alcohol consumption consumption as well. Um, mm -hmm. So therefore, it tends to it tends to kind of neutralise itself. Is is what we've seen in other places. Um, of course. You know, the excess consumption and, and where that leaves people in terms of safety um, when they leave the premises, sometimes on the premises as well, but particularly when they leave, um, is of concern for us. Again, a bit like the drinking up time, if this is extended, you tend to find that you don't have everybody leaving at one time, which helps with that safety. And then there are all those other layers that we need to put in around it that we've talked about around transport and things like that. Um, do you envisage you might need more resources for later opening, or do you think it would just be cost neutral? Well, the reality is that where we're talking about with these, um, you know, we, we already have entertainment licenses that run on into the early hours of the morning, three and four o'clock. Um, this is likely to um, possibly reduce that, um, and we have a placing footprint around that at this point. 
So on weekends, we can deal with that, particularly in, in the city and in the larger towns. The issue for us is um, if we start to see these being applied for and being granted sort of Monday to Thursday, that would have probably a significant impact on our resourcing requirement. Um, we're not clearly geared for a nighttime economy in many places um, during those days, so that's where we would have a concern. Okay. Um, I like your idea maybe about a trial period. Um, that's something I hadn't thought of. So it, it's maybe something the committee can maybe discuss at a later stage. But thank you for your presentation. Thank you. Thanks, Alex. Uh, Mark, can I just ask you then, just a supplementary on Alex's? Your paper had called for a late night levy on late opening alcohol suppliers um, to, to help fund that, the policing for the nighttime economy. Um, if, if that isn't done, will that have an, a, a great effect as well? Well, this is something that we have um, taken again from other cities across the UK, and we do think it is it's important in terms of uh, trying to provide for the safety. And it's not ne ne not necessarily just about police officers; it's about the entire community safety um, arena. Uh, some of the stuff that we've already talked about. Um, so we, we do think that's important. Um, I say that, uh, and and all our remarks here uh, in the context of as as a country we're coming out of uh, the pandemic and the, the impact it's had on the hospitality industry and, and the need for balance in that. And clearly there are, there are um, pressures placed upon police resources and hence we would support the idea of a levy, but we do understand competing demands in the current environment. No, and that was going to be my follow-up was about the current environment, but you've answered that as well. Uh, Mark, I'm going to move on then. I have Kelly, Karen and then Robin. So Kelly? Thank you very much, Chair, um, and thank you very much, ACC McEwen. I'll call you Mark if that's okay. Mark, in your paper, or in the paper, the paper that's been submitted to us, um, 2B, uh, when you talk about there the additional permitted hours, um, and there's a comment made there that it's actually something that is, is quite relevant to yourselves. As a result, there will be a cautioner procedure, or will there be a cautioner procedure available similar to the one currently in place for occasional licence? I'm just wondering... From, from your point of view, um, the cautioner procedure, did that need to be put into a separate piece of legislation elsewhere, or is that something that you would like to see put into this legislation uh, uh, as part of the certain licence premises, you know, receiving the additional um, hours? I think it's, it's something um, that for local residents, we would probably welcome seeing brought into this legislation. Um, I, I'm I'm struggling, I suppose, at this point to see why we would separate it out. Um, and I think, you know, as, a, as I mentioned in my, my remarks at the beginning, there's something about trying to bring the legislation up to date, make it clearer for everybody. So if we have it in one place, in one uh, set of, of legislative documents, I think that's probably easier for everybody. Um, to be honest, Alex and um, Paula have both asked questions that I was going to ask about the late night levy, so I'm glad to hear those answers. The next one I have is about the licence change, where the change of directorship could happen. Um, I come from a community and voluntary sector background, um, and I appreciate completely um, the use of access to NI to protect children and vulnerable people from um, predators. But I'm just wondering, um, is there anything that we can maybe think about that when a directorship um, changes so that police are notified? Because if there are concerns about any director that takes up a licence, um, it's how we get that information. Now, I'm not suggesting that we update access NI to be included, but is there is there a possibility that Access NI might be able to be used even as a um, the basic entry sort of check for that that we would require directors to do that? It doesn't sort of fit with Access NI, but it's the process that that could alert people that that this person is now connected to a, a licensed premises. Yeah, and I think um, we we do have to be. I suppose mindful of what we're asking in terms of access and eye checks and things like that. Um, you know, the, rather than applying it across the board. Um, so, you know, as with any a director of any business, it, it's not always appropriate. Um, however, I think um, for this, um, given that 
there are all the concerns around young people around safeguarding um, and we very much welcome the idea that um, if there is a change in director that ourselves and the courts have to be nominated for those very reasons then I think yes I you know, we would be supportive of that being part of that process. It's an interesting point you bring up, especially when you talk about, you know, the children, especially now that children, if this legislation goes forward, will be, um, you know, allowed to be on premises so much later. Um, it's an interesting concept and it's something that I would be very concerned if you do have a, a, a license holder who, for whatever reason, cannot hold that license and it's passed on to maybe another member of their family or someone else um, and the problems continue it doesn't really resolve anything but um, it's an interesting point uh, thank you very much for making it. it it might be difficult to get access ni to agree to including it but um it would be it, it's a useful mechanism that's already there um, that could help to highlight people but um no uh, that's all my questions it's a quick one from me today mark thank you very much Thank Thanks, you. Kelly. I'm going to ask the supplementary and Kelly's as well. Mark, if you don't mind. Um, I know last week we had the safeguarding uh, board we're in and I had asked them questions around um, safeguarding of children that are on licensed premises, um, whether that's at an underage function or whether that's at a, at a, a family gathering or whatever that might be, uh, about the staff actually that are working within those premises if there is an underage function, whether that is door staff or whatever that might be. And I had asked them, you know, did they feel that, the, that those staff should have any form of, of checks done on them. They didn't seem to um, be either for or against it in any great way. I kind of had my social work head on at that stage and was a bit concerned about that. Are you any concerns about that, Mark, or do you feel that that's not needed? So I think the, the door staff will have SIA checks, um, so or it should be SIA registered. There is, so there, there is always a balance with these things. Um, and whilst it would be easy for me from a policing perspective to say yes, we're fully supportive of that, there is um, the, the, the balance around people's ability to access employment. There is the, the ability for access NI, which is really what the, for, uh, the previous member was talking about in terms of their, their capacity, frankly, to, to deal with all of these checks. And there's also something about the fact that, that that vetting check, if you like, for want of a better description, is, is a snapshot in time. And actually the real controls are around licensed premises. So when we're talking about functions where young people are present, their families are present, you know, close friends and families and responsible adults are there. You have other moderating factors in terms of, you know, other members of staff who are there to keep an eye and uh, management around the premises. So there are many other layers of security and safety, I would say, in, in a well-run premises. Um, and a lot of this comes down to ensuring that, you know, we support those businesses that uh, are well-run and we, we, we have an effective inspection and enforcement criteria around those that aren't. Um, so uh, that, that's a very long-winded answer. Um, I, I do think there's a reality to what we can expect in terms of capacity, frankly, for, for vetting checks for all of these things, um, which which may then grind the industry down as well. Um, and I don't think it is uppermost in terms of safeguarding. I think all these other factors are probably as or more important. Yeah, no, I understand that. I understand I've had a, a case this week in my office with someone who's waiting on their access NI check, and there's been a hold up on it. So I know that uh, there, there's a lot of pressure they're under there as well. Um, I'm going to move on then. I have Karen and then Robin and then Mark. So Karen. Thank you, Chair, and thank you, Mark. Um, I suppose I just want to go back and put on the, the transport infrastructure. I also live in a city where um, we don't have... Uh, we don't have that in place. I suppose getting the taxi is the only option and getting that is like uh, hands teeth. So thankfully I live not too far away and I can walk home, but I know that many don't go out in the city because of that. So if we could um, improve that along the way, along with this bill and along with making it safer, our night time economy could, could do, would thrive so much better. Mark, in terms of clause two, and that brings me on to the safety issue, it said um, in terms of the later permitted hours, um, there greater potential for increased antisocial behaviour and on-street drinking. Um, have you got evidence? Is there evidence there that we should be aware of, or is that the view of the PSNI? So I think uh, 
in terms of, and, and this probably comes down to the, the fact that actually by clarifying the legislation would probably help to deal with some of that. Um, very often where we see is where we have unregulated um, sort of late night drinking where you'll, you'll end up with the antisocial behaviour and the on-street drinking. We're back to this bit around all the layers we need to put in around the premises when people are kicking out um, uh, or exiting the premises, I should probably say. The, uh, uh, so it will require, it does, so, and it depends what you term as antisocial behaviour as well. So we will often see complaints and incidents around, um, you know, late night takeaways um, and things like that. And, and again, this is where if we don't have the infrastructure right to support it, we end up with large crowds in one area and then people who are either resident or trying to run businesses um, become frustrated with that or find that it is impacting on them. Um, and it's again where you have large crowds of people, uh, particularly when uh, people have been drinking, that you start to get you know, low level assaults and criminality of that nature and you can see an increase in sexual offending and, and, and things like that. Um, the key to this is, is, is around, you know, and we are supportive of this, is around the clarity of that extension, um, particularly at, at the weekends, um, when we already have a, a policing footprint that we can respond to this with, um, so it's not impacting on our resourcing. Um, we do, as I said earlier, have concerns about the Monday to Thursday element of it, and we'd have to see how that would go. Uh, but it is everything that you, you kind of opened with um, in terms of having, you know, taxi ranks there, marshals, other capable guardians in the street, whether they are council-led wardens, some of our third sector people who do a fantastic job, and just that moderating presence. And also then looking at, um, you know, the wider nighttime economy. So takeaways and restaurants. You know, having them open at the same time so that you're not left with a crowd in one particular place. Mm -hmm. um, you know, one of the things that has been in, under discussion um, for many, many uh, um, years in Northern Ireland has been around uh, the licensing of, of uh, food outlets. Uh, so by doing that, you start to, to deal with some of these issues. Um, so about, about a quarter um, of violent crime in Northern Ireland is attributable to the hours of between one, uh, over 100 and 400, so one and four in the morning. Um, and so that's the sort of evidence we're looking to. It's not necessarily, as I say, just about the licensed premises. It's about how do we put in place all those other community safety aspects um, that enable people to go out, have a good night out, the economy can thrive, uh, and in fact, if you can um, you know, it, it does rejuvenate city centres, if you like, if you have that sort of cafe culture and then late into the night, but it's safe and it feels safe for people who are walking about as well. Yeah, Mark, as I say, in my opening comments, I agree with you around the, the safety. I think by, you know, extending the hours, um, uh, it, it, it would be more manageable. And, to, and, that, and, and all of that, you, you quite, quite rightly highlighted all the other, the takeaway outlets and everything else. And just as the chair had highlighted at the start of this, um, you know, they're, they're mostly what, what you would see is very vulnerable, more vulnerable people at that time of night as well. So it's, it's taken under account for that and providing that safety. We have an opportunity here to really, really address all of that. So... Um, thank you very much, Mark, for, for your briefing today and your answer. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Karen. I'm going to move on to Mark, or sorry, Robin. Robin, you're first. Okay, thank you, Chair, and thank ACC McEwen for attending today. Um, when you get to sort of number five or six, or whatever it is in the packing order, most of the questions <laughs> have already been asked. Um, could I maybe just pick you up on one comment uh, that you made? Uh, you had indicated that indeed you felt it changes that were proposed that the PSNI could in fact uh, handle those changes without it having a great impact, uh, a negative impact on your own uh, manpower. You then picked up on the clause uh, four, the uh, basis of Article 45 authorizations for additional permitted hours. 
not been widely used in the last number of years. But I, I presume if if Clause 4 came into being and the additional hours were allowed, that would stretch the PSNI resources significantly? Uh, yes, and uh, uh, thank you to the member for, for, for clarifying, actually. So um, when we look at Clause 2 and the, um, the ability to extend further through the court, um, opening our serene until two o'clock in the morning on a Friday, Saturday, um, twelve to twelve thirty, Monday to Thursday. It's um, we are supportive of that, and we think we can absorb that because most of those um, uh, are Article Forty Four licensees and um, already run to one o'clock in the morning on a Friday, Saturday morning. Um, so that is is different then um, from Clause Four. Um, which looks at, um, so those who are, are running um, with an Article 45, so primarily what are, what are deemed as more rural uh, pubs and restaurants, um, they, they do, there's not a big uh, uptake of those where there is up to 20 times a year. Um, we're, we're easily able to, to manage locally and there's generally a good relationship and a good understanding of what that event would look like. Um, by local police. If that was to increase and was to be taken up, that would, first of all, the police administer that scheme. Um, so the, the ability for all those licensed premises to quadruple those applications would have an impact for us in terms of administration, um, which we would need to cost and, and, and give a view on in, in terms of what the actual resource requirement would be, but it, it, it would be reasonably um, it would certainly have an impact, um, particularly in, in the current climate. Um, but in terms of the actual policing um, in those rural areas, that would have an impact if we were to see that increase. Um, and as I say, so in the larger towns and the cities, we are we are geared up for a night ten economy. We're not necessarily in the smaller towns and more rural locations, so that would have a significant impact in policing. The environment's different as well, so I think. Um, that would require quite a bit of, of thought um, and if it was to be administered by the police again that burden would fall to local police to try and uh, understand the impact on local residents and things like that so those are two very different proposals really um, the first one we're supportive of we think we can manage uh, and would help um, the, the industry uh, clause four actually does give us some concern and we need to work through the detail of that okay thank you uh, ACC McEwen. Thank you, Chair. Okay, thank you, Robin. Um, can I then bring in Mark? Thank you, Chair, and, and thanks, Mark, for coming in and for the PSNI submission. It was a wee sort of supplementary. The ship has sailed a wee bit now on the late night levy uh, issue. But just in terms of, Mark, a, a wee bit more information on that, if you have it. Uh, do you know how it operates exactly? Is it a flat levy for every establishment or is it based on readable value or do you know any of that detail? Uh, I don't have that detail to hand, Chair. Um, we, well, what I can do is, is, is put out some of the, the practice that exists elsewhere in the UK and share it with the committee on the written submission if that's, if that's acceptable. Super, no, that would be very helpful, Mark. And then I don't know if you caught the, the previous evidence session, but we, we had a wee bit of chat around alcohol on buses. I'm sure it's something you're familiar with. The issue that is they're trying to deal with it rather than consuming it yourself. <laughs> now, I can really helpfully remind you say that there was a law passed in 2011 that, I, I mean, it, it made the legal consumption of alcohol on buses en route to sporting fixtures. What's your experience of that legislation? Have there been any prosecutions re related to that? Or, um, To my knowledge, that there hasn't been, um, um, as far as I'm aware. Um, we, we haven't had particular issues around that. I think actually it has. I, I only caught the tail end of that previous submission. So um, I think 
And it's not it's not necessarily sporting events. So we have that yeah, in, in so for people travel to licensed premises on buses would be much more of a problem for you than people traveling to sports events. Yeah, and it's things like big events, big concerts, um, which was again working to support um, because they're a really important part of sort of the fabric of society and, and to a thriving um, you know, uh, both economy and, and cultural part of our society. It's, it's things like that where we see coach loads of particularly young people, um, not necessarily underage, but um, who, who are arriving and already um, quite heavily intoxicated. Um, so we're then left with the, the, the situation where safeguarding arrangements need to be put in place around those uh, individuals. Um, and obviously very often they will have arrangements made to, to go home later that night. Um, there is almost a pattern to a night out where people are going to have a few drinks, they're going to enjoy an event and go home and, and they have the rhythm is there and it's, it's established. But actually then when they arrive um, in, in, a, in, a, in a state where you need to put into place safeguarding arrangements, they can't go to the concert, um, that provide, you know, it poses difficulties for us and for our partners and the councils and the event organisers. So the ability to be able to, to intervene earlier um, and deal with that type of, of preloading on buses um, would, would be very welcome. No, so it's a very tough, tough stuff to, to crack. I think as, or as we've, we've discussed already, because then of course there's also, I'm sure, thousands of people who travel to events and buses and maybe consume some alcohol, but, but don't get in that sort of state, you know, they do it responsibly. Yeah, and I think, it, you know, as with a lot of these things in public spaces, um, it, I, th I think if, for clarity for the, particularly the public, but then for those who are trying to operate businesses, including the coach operators themselves, uh, and for enforcement um, bodies, it, I, think, I think you have to have an absolute in this. Um, we can't, as, as was mentioned earlier, you know, it's, it's impossible to ask uh, someone who's, who's qualified as a coach driver to then have to try and maintain who's becoming intoxicated and who isn't. Absolutely. And that's, that's very different in a bar setting. Um, so I, I think you probably do need an absolute in this. Okay, now thank you, Mark. Okay, Mark, thank you. Um, that, no other members have indicated they want to ask anything further, so I have to then say thank you. Um, to Mark for joining us today. Thank you for your submission um, to the inquiry and also for your brief here um, to us as a committee. So thank you very much. Thank you, Chair. Okay, bye-bye. Okay. All right, members, we're going to then move swiftly on to agenda item seven, which is again another briefing on the licensing and registration of clubs amendment bill. And this next briefing is from NI Alcohol and Drug Alliance. Um, members, you'll find this at page 131 of your meeting pack. And can I then welcome to the meeting Pauline Campbell and Andrea Trainer. Um, Pauline and Andrea, you're both very welcome. Um, I you. have five to ten minutes to brief the committee, and then the committee will continue with some questions after that. So do you want to go ahead? Okay. Um, as I said, my name is Pauline Campbell and I'm the Vice Chair of NIADA. Uh, NIADA just to give you a wee bit of a flavour of who we are, NIADA is an alliance which was formed in the summer of 2016 and it facilitates cooperation among voluntary and community sector organisations supporting those affected by alcohol and drug use and their families. Um, our main purposes are to come together as organisations to create an independent, cohesive voice we advocate and hope to influence policy, practice and service delivery. We campaign for the voluntary and community sector to be involved in the development, design and delivery of alcohol and drug services. And we provide members with direct access to PHA and the Department of Health decision making processes. And um, we provide members with networking, information sharing and public opportunities. The chairperson of NIADA is Anne-Marie McClure, who is the CEO of Star360. And we currently have 13 member organisations, uh, which include ASSERT, Star360, Simon Community, DePaul, Northlands, um, Addiction NI, to name a few. 
Our vision is to have a society where people affected by alcohol and drug use have access to the right services in the right place at the right time. And we, our mission is to work collaboratively to raise awareness and influence policy and practice on the impact of alcohol and drug use on individual families and communities. I suppose in response to this consultation, all of our members uh, organisations provide services uh, i.e. education and prevention, hidden harm services, low threshold, treatment, recovery, residential and support within the field of addiction. We work with individual family members, homelessness, adults, young people and communities who have all been impacted by alcohol, drugs and polydrug misuse. But we have seen personally the impact alcohol misuse, dependency and addiction has on our service users, their families and, and communities. Um, we estimate to work with over uh, 50,000 individuals per year. Certainly within the last three to five years, we've seen complex presentations of individuals and family members. Uh, there's dual diagnosis, polydrug use, early onset, uh, the majority um, around the age category of 14 to 18, and also a family history. Alcohol is seen as a gateway drug and most commonly used. Always and so always in the picture, um, and just as an overview, the more females are, are the more males than females are accessing our services. Um, and I'm, I'm sure you are aware of NISRA and the report that um, was published a couple of weeks ago in relation to alcohol-specific death rates in the UK from 2001 to 2019. And for the first time, Northern Ireland is on a par with Scotland in relation to alcohol-specific deaths. And we've seen an increase in alcohol-related deaths since 2013. Now, the COVID pandemic has hit us all, and all of our services are working through the medium of online. Pubs are closed. Um, off license, you can't buy any drink after 8 o'clock. Um, but we are still seeing an increase of referrals to our services in relation to alcohol. Now, there may be a number of reasons for this, and it could be to do with the fact that people are isolated and not in denial. Uh, family, we've really seen an increase in family members availing of the services. Um, so I just thought that point was very interesting. For example, Carlisle House in 77, that's a residential treatment uh, service, and there were 77 alcohol related referrals in 2019. And this has increased to 81 in 2020. Davina, Davina's ARC, who uh, reside in Newry, had 62 referrals of alcohol in 2020. And Addiction NI had 902 um, in 2020. The Newry Addiction Services, um, we provide our young people, as well as other services, we provide a young people service in the Southern Board, 11 to 25 year olds, funded by the PHA. And in 2018 to 2019, 27% of the referrals for the young people service was alcohol. Um, whereas the 1st of April 2020 to January 2021, there's been 122 referrals to the 11 to 25 year old service, and 45% of them have been alcohol referrals. Um, 38% were male and 35% female. And these are these are only alcohol figures only, and they um, haven't included drug figures. So, our thoughts on the bill. So, we have 13 members, and um, it was difficult to pull everybody's all together and put it into one submission, but we did that. And overall, we agree with the bill, but our areas of concern are around children and young people. Uh, we welcome the proposals on the alignment of liquor, entertainment and refreshment provision, the delivery of intoxicating liquor to young persons, the prohibition on self-service and sales by vending machines. Uh, the members felt that we need to come from a harm reduction and prevention route rather than a uh, wait until crisis point. That it's really important that we educate our young people reducing their, the normality around drinking. Young people grow up to be adults reaching for help with problem drinking. And we really would recommend the public health messages re-alcohol should be the driving force behind the policy's objectives. 
We welcome the study um, that's going to be led by the University of Stirling, which is seeking to understand recent changes in opening hours for bars and nightclubs and how these changes impact on health, crime levels and emergency services in Scotland. It will be the first study in the UK to look at how opening hours affect ambulance call-outs and crimes alongside an exploration of the impact on public services and businesses operations. Um, and also builds upon previous studies in Norway and Amsterdam and Australia that find that even opening an hour late after midnight can lead to significantly more salts or alcohol related ambulance call outs. Again, going back to the young people, we recommend that all necessary safeguards are in place to protect children from the promotion of alcohol and prevent access to alcohol when in licensed premises. Wealth of information and evidence about the negative impact that exposure to excessive alcohol consumption has on children, the impact at ground level, for example, hidden harm, extended family, drinking across all social class um, and seen as a cultural acceptance, with physical and mental impact, problematic drunk drinking can impact, we believe, on anyone. And Rather than increase opportunity for exposure, we need to reduce it with positive things and consider alternatives. Also, the members wanted me to say today um, that what would really impact and help is um, increased price, uh, looking at minimum unit pricing. And I know um, within the near future, there will be a consultation on minimum unit pricing. And from the Alice point of view, we have been um, closely networking with the Republic of Ireland and also uh, Scotland, the Department of Health in Scotland, and we're aware of the evaluations that have been carried out into minimum use unit pricing. And in fact, as part of our virtual conference this year, the theme will be on minimum unit pricing. Um, we believe that it's what also could impact would is reduce availability, the number of alcohol outlets in different communities in time. But really importantly is the restricted marketing and consultation about outdoor alcohol advertising and sponsorships of events to protect children. Um, just briefly before there's any questions, we have um, commissioned two pieces of work, pieces of research uh, carried out with Queen's. One is an alcohol and drug use sorry, alcohol and drug use in the workplace. And the other um, piece of research was service users' experience during lockdown. And um, so we had some interesting results and um, we're more than happy to share the, the research papers. Okay, Pauline, is that you finished? That's me finished, thank you. Okay, thanks Pauline. And yeah, we would love to see the, those research papers as well. I think it would certainly help uh, help the committee as well. Uh, in two weeks' time, we go into our, our deliberations, so any information we have would be greatly appreciated. Um, I just want to, to start by saying, um, you know, as a as a constituency MLA and as, actually as a resident of Northern Ireland and a someone uh, as a mum, a daughter, a, a sister, all of those things, I I, I absolutely see the harm that um, misuse of alcohol does. Um, to people, to families, and to our communities, and I think that is why it is essential that that we, as a committee, um, listen to all views um, that are expressed there. And I know you had mentioned there about Carlisle House that it was also mentioned when we had the churches in. Um, the Presbyterian Church had mentioned about that and about the lack of services that we do have here in Northern Ireland when it comes to all addictions. Um, but certainly, um, uh, with with we've seen that increase, of, as you had said, with alcohol abuse, where we're now on the same level as Scotland, and, and that is that is quite frightening. So it is as well. Um, so I, I mean that this that all of much of that is beyond the remit of of our bill. Um, most certainly, uh, you'd mentioned there about the minimum unit pricing. I had raised that with the the minister on Tuesday in the chamber. And he hopes that the consultation will will be out before the end of this mandate. But it will be up to the next mandate then um, to actually bring about the legislation for that. And I know we've been waiting on that um, probably just about as as many years as we've been waiting on the licensing bill. Because I sat in health committee for a number of years, so I remember it well. Like, so just say and, and to thank you as well, and thank all of your organisations because without your organisations, it would we would be in an awfully an awful lot worse position. 
um, in Northern Ireland, you do pick up the pieces, um, not only for those, but those, those users, but also those many families whose lives are greatly affected. So thank you for all that you do. Um, I just want to ask you a couple of questions. The first one is in relation to, um, you stated that you felt that the bill um, was too heavily weighted towards the economic benefits and not sufficiently addressed in terms of public health. Um, so it's just to ask you, what do you feel, what more could be put in the bill to, to bolster that public health, um, given the remit of the bill uh, as well? Um. I, th I think it's important. We, we talked about. Uh, let me see now. Let me get my. my um, it's quite difficult because I can speak on behalf of Dunleary, but this is a whole member um, and members of thirteen. So I'm conscious that I I need to represent Nayara. Um, so, did you mind just asking me that again? It's just that, um, it, it, is there anything else you would like to see in this bill or like to see us look at or any amendments we could bring forward? Just to bolster yeah. the, the public health side, um, we, yeah. we, I mean, you very much think that it, it's weighted towards the economic benefits, which I can see your understanding for that. Um, we did, we have yeah. had the public health agency in as well, and they have concerns around this also. Um, so, okay. is there something more we need to be looking at? just to bolster that public health side. Um, it could be the review. I don't know if you have an opinion on that, um, where we look at the uh, the, uh, the extended opening hours. Um, we would like, it ha or not we would like, but certainly the committee has heard from various people who would say, well, that needs to be in the bill, that there must be a review within a year. Would that be something, maybe? Yeah, I would, totally agree with that. I would totally agree with that, with the review um, of ex the extended hours. Um, certainly, we have um, we have would have concerns around uh, individual stockpiling and and preloading pre and uh, the damage that uh, binge drinking and excessive drinking can do to an individual from an emotional physical uh, point of view. I think one of the other things that we really are uh, concerned about and want to put forward is the whole advertising of alcohol, particularly to um, the younger population and how that exposure from a very young age can impact on, on our young person and adolescents. And as we've seen between the four, age of 14 to 25, that can be the starting age for someone to actually start using substances. Um, the younger the younger a person is when starting to drink, the greater the risk of alcohol-related harm, not just in adolescents, but across their lifespan. And uh, somehow advertising and ex you know, young people um, extended their in social clubs and sporting clubs. Um, we just find the link between alcohol and, and, and sport um, a bit contradictory. And we... Um, worry about advertising and um, just normalising and, and, and making it seem that it's normal and it's normal to, um, it's just a cultural, normalising the cultural um, aspect of, of alcohol. Thank you for that. I just wanted to ask then further, a number of places your paper um, talks about the Republic of Ireland's Public Health Alcohol Act. Um, do you think if we had such a piece of legislation here, now it's not within the scope of this uh, this bill, um, would it make the, the bill more easily accepted um, around those concerns of public health? I, I, I do. Um, we, we have linked very uh, closely with the Republic of Ireland and um, we're aware of the adverti no advertisements in cinemas, no advertisements uh, close to schools. Um, and, and we've also heard that there's been a couple of loopholes in relation to that, that there is advertisements besides schools, but it's about non-alcoholic drink. Um, so I, I think, yes, um, you know, the, their alcoholized uh, advertisement on public service vehicles, the public transport stops or stations, uh, crash and uh, local authority playgrounds will be prohibited. Um, and we, we can see the validity, validity of these measures and would, would strongly recommend that the Department for Communities 
consider similar measures in Northern Ireland. Yeah, and I suppose we have, we have, we have got advertising as part of this bill, so we maybe look, need to look at that uh, as a committee when we're doing our deliberations as to how that could maybe expand it. Um, slightly more, if that was possible, we could look at that. Um, I, I liked your comment around the um, the uh, uh, the codes of practice, where he had said it was akin to the fox guarding the chicken shed. Um, so I, I take that you very much uh, would not want the industry being industry led, um, and you would want that something else. Do you think that that as it's proposed in the bill for a statutory led is acceptable, or would you like to see something more than that? No, just exactly what you've said there. I just want to go back to the, the point of the advertisement as well. Um, and you know, if you take the Scottish football, ladies football. Um, they don't accept any sponsorship in relation to alcohol and uh, and also gambling, um, and I, I just think that that's very important to take on board. Yeah, no, I um, okay, I have got a, a couple of members who are waiting to ask some questions as well. I've got Robin and then Sinead. So, Robin, do you want to go ahead? Uh, thank the delegation, and uh, I have to say I admire your skills in terms of bringing the number of organisations that are within you together to uh, promote uh, one paper. You might want to uh, offer your skills to the executive on. on uh, <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, anyway, just, I, I don't have a question as such. I do, and I want to join with the chair in the tribute that she paid to you in the work that you do, uh, indeed in the very sharp end of, of things with the, uh, the those who have uh, unfortunately become uh, addicted, uh, and indeed for the wider family uh, of, of the addict and the impact that it has. And uh, like the chair, I represent a uh, my office is in an inner city area, um, and we do see uh, an awful lot of, of, of the, the, the problems. It's really just a comment, and I think it's an ambition of yours, and I, I, I would be an ambition of mine. I don't know how we can, can achieve it. Um, were you responding to um, uh, clauses 12 and 8, um, permitting the attendance of young people to remain on licensed premises? Uh, you, you, you just make the, the, the uh, use the words the Mediterranean drinking pattern places to drink show us all that more moderate drinking uh, uh, and that seems to be a, a worthy uh, uh, ambition if we could ever ar arrive there. I, I really in, in the Northern Ireland culture of drinking I don't think that really is possible without a major major sea change in in, 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 in attitudes within society, would I be right in that? And is that your thinking as well? Oh, Pauline, we can't hear you. Oh, sorry, no, sorry. Um, maybe that's a good thing. <laughs> uh, right, I think the yeah, we, we said about the Mediterranean model, um, and however, there's been if I can just go back to my notes here, sorry. Um, okay. I think the attitudes would need to change quite significantly within the Northern Ireland context in, in relation to it. We, you know, it's about people. Um, Staggering their their drinking times um, and the impact that has on on physical and mental and emotional well being. Uh, I, I've really nothing more to say about that. Sorry. Oh, that's perfectly fine. Brand, okay. Thank you. Thanks, Robin. I have then Sinead waiting to come in, so we can bring in Sinead. Thank you, Chair, um, and thanks to Pauling and Andrea um, for coming before us today. You know, I, I doubt there's there's hardly a family in Ireland that hasn't been affected by alcoholism or, or some kind of um, alcohol addiction problems. But and I'm glad you mentioned Davina's Ark, Pauling, um, in Newry. And I've worked with Davina's Ark, and we have sister concilios as well um, mm -hmm. in, 
very, very good um, charities doing a lot of good work in terms of addiction. And I know Davina's Ork uh, focus a lot on, on the trauma that's associated with addiction, which is very very uh, not very often spoke about so you know while while, while you know there's services to treat the, the the person with the addiction very often the trauma associated with that addiction will affect family so there's a lot of good work going on um in my own area locally with with Davina's Ark and Sister Consilios I just want to take you back to the um to the issue of advertising and you've, you've largely covered it to be fair but we've had some um uh, submissions to the committee over the last number of weeks and advertising things to be sort of the sticking point um clause 16 uh, and there's been some contradictory opinion shall we say in terms of the um the effect advertising has on on people with who already have a, 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 an alcohol related problem or young people who are more susceptible um, to that that advertising and we know advertising works or else it wouldn't be a multi-billion pound um uh, you know uh, thing so just in your in Niada's experience um do what would you would you agree that you know excessive advertising or advertising in general specifically when it's um when it's geared towards younger people does have an effect on younger people and does make them more susceptible to um to drink in the first place and those people who already have um, a, a, an alcohol-related problem, would advertising um, or the prevalence of advertising um, and promotions and, and things like that would that be would, would that affect them in terms of them being able to manage their their addiction? Um, from our experience, uh, yes, it can be very difficult for someone who's in recovery and, and seeing advertising billboards about alcohol and seeing the uh, the glamorous advertisement on TV about alcohol. So yes, it can impact, but it's important that them individuals have the coping skills um, within their toolbox to deal with that. Uh, in relation to young people, you know, there's a lot of influences for young people in relation to alcohol. Uh, uh, it could be anything from their own personality to uh, peer pressure to um, family life to what's maybe hidden harm at home. Um, but advertising is certainly seen within the alcohol fate, uh, uh, as being glamorous, as being cool, as and, and some young people can buy into that. Um, now, I have seen recently, um, as our members have seen, the increase of non-alcoholic drinks and the choice uh, for for people, individuals or, or young people to go for that. And we've seen a, a, a big rise in that. But I, I just really think that we need to be very careful about how our young people are exposed to alcohol. They need... Uh, really good preventative education in relation to if they choose to drink, how to drink, some harm minimization. Um, but we just know that we are at the, the other side of it. We're at the side of it where people are coming through our door and it has impacted uh, and the consequences have been so damaging for their life and their families. Um, from an IADA's point of view, we are very privileged to work with these individuals because they've had the confidence and, and the, the courage to, to deal with their life. But advertising, certainly, going back to your point, it, it, we just feel that um, we would like all advertisement in relation to alcohol ban. And can I just come in there as well, please? Um, when we were discussing this with our members, I think one of the points that came up was um, we don't advertise tobacco anymore. And we also talked about we don't advertise any kind of drugs. Um, so where does the advertising around alcohol fit in with this? You know, and that kind of sparked the conversation of why it needs to be looked at. Thank you. Yeah, and I suppose, you know, like sporting organizations will be another area where, you know, it, it, the promotion or the prevalence of advertising um, needs to be looked at. I know the GAA have completely ended any advertisement uh, in relation to gambling. And I think they're uh, well on the way to phasing out or maybe completely phasing out uh, any association with, with alcohol advertising. So um, that's a good model to follow for, for other um, sport associations, because we know obviously that that's a big impact on, on young people's lives and um, being yeah. members of different uh, sporting organizations. So 
No, I, I know. I know with the Six Nations, the rugby, that um, in 2020, every 15 seconds there was um, it could be seen about alcohol sponsorship, um, and there's some research done on that. So every 15 every 15 seconds, sorry, there was a, a, a glimpse of a sponsorship in relation to alcohol. Mm-hmm. You know, that's a real lot of overexposure. Yeah, that's quite shocking when you, when you say it out loud like that. But um, listen, that that's it for me. I just wanted to tease out that, that we piece on the advertising. So that's been very useful. Thank you, Polly and Andrea. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you, Sinead. Um, there's no other member who has indicated that they want to ask a question. So um, I will then finish off this part of the briefing then by saying thank you to Pauline and Andrea. Um, uh, not only for your submission to the inquiry, but for being here with us today, and and um, certainly it was uh, it was a good uh, a good discussion, and you did certainly bring up some points that hadn't been brought up before. So thank you very much. You might be interested to know that our next uh, uh, witness briefing after you is Stirling University. So um, yeah, so there you are. So whenever you hang up your call, you might want to log on to the the, the NI Assembly Live TV, and then you'll be able to watch that as well, as you did mention it, you know. So yeah, yeah, I'm just be interested in, in their in their results from their study. Yeah, look, thank you very much, Pauline. Thank, thank you, Andrea. Thank you. All right, thank you very much. All right, members. Bye. We're going to move on then to our, um, is this our last briefing on this? Yes. Yeah, it is. Okay. Hold on two texts. I was on the wrong page and thought I had one more after this. Okay. Agenda item eight then, members, which, as I said, is a briefing from Stirling University, again, on the licensing and registration of clubs amendment bill. You'll find this item at page 137 of your meeting pack. Um, Can I then welcome Rachel O'Donnell and Neve Fitzgerald? Um, to the meeting. Uh, you are both very welcome and your, your name has been mentioned in a, a, a previous uh, witness session there just before you. Um, I know, understand that you have a PowerPoint presentation as well, is that correct, to do? So can I then, without further ado, just hand straight over to yourselves um, because we're just conscious of time and we want to be able to get members to have as much time as possible to ask questions. So go ahead. Thank you very much. And Rachel is just bringing up the slides there. I'll introduce us. So I'm Neve Fitzgerald. I'm a professor of alcohol policy at the Institute for Social Marketing and Health at the University of Stirling, where um, Rachel is a, a research fellow, Dr. Rachel O'Donnell, who I'll hand over to in a moment. So we'll take you through this presentation. Um, our institute specializes in research on public health policy. So pricing, advertising and availability of alcohol is really kind of within our, our sort of core areas. We're going to focus today on the measures in the bill, um, but I know that you've been discussing advertising, so happy to take questions on that. Um, I know there were some questions around minimum pricing as well, so you know the discussion may be broader, but we've, um, we're happy to, to provide further evidence or to have colleagues come if, if that would be useful. Um, so I think if we can, so I can see the slide, but I can't see the slide show just now. Um, okay, let's have a... I don't know if that's what others are seeing. We, we can just see your your screen as it is. Oh, there we oh, go. That's, that's it, it now. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Great. Yeah, so we can go to the next slide, I think. So this okay. slide is just, hopefully in a moment, just going to yeah, show you some of the studies that we're working on that have informed this presentation. I'm not going to talk you through them in detail, um, but just to mention that the third one that, that is on this, uh, the slides are not moving for me, but I'll carry on in a way. They're not moving for me just now, Eve. I'm going to come out briefly and then try and come back in again, if that's okay. Yep. Okay. And I'll just talk you through that study in the interest of time. So uh, the third study that you'll see on on the slide that's going to come up is called Elephant. It's about evaluating later or expanded hours for alcohol premises in the nighttime economy. Um, So that is specifically looking at uh, small changes. So one hour or one and a half hour extensions in opening hours for licensed premises in Glasgow and Aberdeen cities. And that has um, a significant amount of funding to look at what all of the range in terms of businesses, um, health and uh, police impacts um, that might have both positive and negative. So we've just started that study, but um, but I think it's important just to flag that, you know, that there is, I suppose, open questions about what the impact is of, of later licensing hours that, that need to be answered. And um, so we'll just move on then. And just as a kind of overview, of uh, how licensing can make a difference to um, outcomes in terms of harms. 
And, and you know, this, some of this is kind of obvious, but I suppose the, the main thing that we think about in relation to licensing is how it controls the availability of a product. If you don't have a license, you can't sell the product. And it's pretty straightforward, unquestioned economic theory that if it's easier to purchase a product that people want, um, that that purchase is more likely. So the more easy you make it for people to buy alcohol, the more they will buy and the more they will then consume. Um, but there are other ways in which licensing also makes a difference. So if you have a lot of premises in an area that can introduce uh, competitive price pressure, so it can mean that uh, there's a pressure on premises to sell more cheaply. If it's cheaper, people do also purchase more. Again, that's just also economic theory, um, and that leads to more consumption. Um, but also, I think what your last um, witness I was watching on the live stream was saying quite clearly is that you know every premises that you have also acts as a kind of reminder of alcohol. You know, it's an opportunity to purchase alcohol. It's it's an advert. There's um, merchandising. There's um, posters in the windows and so on. So we'll come back to that later in terms of uh, how that's a consideration for children and for people in recovery from alcohol problems. So you might say, what does it matter if, if all of this leads to increased consumption? Um, and I think this is one of the key points that we really want to get across today is that um, when you look at uh, the overall harms from alcohol consumption in terms of health harms, it is population consumption that drives those harms. So it's not antisocial behavior in a minority of people. It's not dependent drinkers. It's actually um, the whole population and the level of consumption across the population. And uh, if we look at the figures on the next slide, just in relation to alcohol-related deaths in Northern Ireland, and um, what we see is that they have risen actually up to 2017. They increased by over 40% in Northern Ireland, where in other parts of the United Kingdom, there were increases only of between 6 and 9%. And what we also see is that that rise has continued. So the highest uh, rate ever was in 2019. Whereas what we see in Scotland um, after the introduction of minimum unit pricing is that alcohol-specific deaths have fallen. And the other point that I wanted to make here is that these are just the deaths that are wholly caused by alcohol. There is a much larger number of deaths in which alcohol is a contributory factor along with other things that are not shown here. And I suppose that the main point here is, um, is that you don't see these deaths in antisocial behavior. They're not observable, really. It's hard to detect these increases by nurses or doctors or police officers on the front line. You only see these when you actually sort of study them and analyze how they are changing compared to other areas. Um, but what we also see is that, that across multiple countries all over the world, it holds true that the more a population drinks, then the more you get in terms of these health harms. And those harms can be affected by the measures in your licensing bill. So it's not just things like minimum unit pricing that affect these harms. And I think you should um, be considering how the measures in the bill actually directly affect them. Uh, just finally on this slide is just to say that we don't actually um, have access to the data on alcohol sales in Northern Ireland. So sales data is the most reliable measure of likely future harm. Um, it is available through commercial companies, but it hasn't been purchased or made available for researchers to analyze, nor has it been publicly uh, published. So that's something just, if you're looking at a review, um, would be really important to address. So I'll move quite quickly through the next couple of slides. So we're going to talk about uh, the timing of when alcohol can be purchased, where it can be purchased, and pricing over the course of this presentation. So just moving first on to the timing um, and looking at the evidence internationally as to uh, what difference it makes uh, when premises are open later. So we go on to that one just now. Um, what we find is that uh, across all of the studies that have been done, there's a clear link between late night opening, so extended late night opening of alcohol premises and increased harms, so drunkenness, assaults, injuries, or use of health and police services uh, and other services. Um, so that's sort of across all the studies that have ever been done, this link holds true. But when you look at more recent studies in high income countries, um, particularly focusing in on the studies in Norway here, because it I think is the one that is focused on smaller towns and small cities that would be maybe more of similar size to what you have in Northern Ireland. Um, what they found there was that for every extra one hour extension to opening times, you've got a 16% increase in police reported assaults. Um, at, at night time. And if they reduced those opening hours, you got that converse exactly 16% also reduction in those assaults. So a really clear link in both directions between um, late night opening hours and uh, police reported assaults. Uh, the Amsterdam study is the only one that has looked at alcohol related ambulance call outs, but that's the outcome that we're using in Scotland for our study. So I think if we move on. Thank you, Dave. Uh, 
So let's take a moment to have a look at the outline of the current Northern Ireland regulations regarding opening hours and some of the measures that are proposed in the current bill as well. One of the proposed measures is for additional nights with later hours, whereby public houses and hotels can apply for an additional one hour of late opening up to 104 times a year. What difference do additional nights and later hours actually make? Well, to answer this question, let's consider this. Adding an extra nightclub to a city where multiple nightclubs already exist may create extra space for, say, a few hundred additional people to drink and dance for a couple of hours late at night. But when you add an extra hour of opening to standard late night hours, this allows everyone to drink for an extra hour. This point is reflected in the quote on this slide from a public health interviewee in our recent excellence study. And I won't read the quote out, I'll, I'll let you read it for yourselves. But essentially, it reflects the evidence base which demonstrates, as Neve has already said, that the longer alcohol is available for, the more people tend to drink, leading to an increased risk of range of alcohol related harms, including crime related disorder and longer term health harms as well. So the potential impacts of granting an additional one hour late night opening time up to 104 times a year also needs to be considered carefully in conjunction with the proposal to extend drinking up time from 30 minutes to one hour. Because when you take these two proposed measures together, this effectively means extending light, late night openings, most likely at week weekends by 90 minutes. And I think it's very important to carefully consider the risks that Neve has already outlined related to later opening hours and the impacts on harms that were on that previous slide. So based on the evidence already presented, um, the one hour extension of closing times in Northern Ireland with extra drinking up time could be expected to be associated with a substantial increase in alcohol related ambulance call outs and police reported assaults, for example. I'd like us to move on just to quickly talk about drinking up time and the proposals in the bill as well. So here's a note of the different drinking up times in the rest of the UK, just for comparison purposes. So you can see in England and Wales, there's no legally defined drinking up time. In Scotland, our drinking up time is 15 minutes. And in the Republic of Ireland, drinking up time is 30 minutes. The proposal to extend drinking up time from 30 to 60 minutes in Northern Ireland is quite unusual by comparison. And the rationale for this proposed change isn't entirely clear. There's little or no evidence about whether extended drinking up times in practice lead to benefits or harms. But for smaller premises, the costs of keeping staff on for longer during a period when alcohol can't be sold may limit the appeal of this proposed measure. There's also no evidence base to suggest that drinking up time leads to easier dispersal of customers. So there's no suggestion that this would actually decrease instances of disorder around closing time. And I suppose what we're concerned with is also about how any extension to drinking up time would be enforced to ensure that it doesn't simply lead to later serving of alcohol. There's also the risk that consumers would purchase more alcohol at last orders, knowing that they had an hour to drink it, essentially having the same effect as extending serving time with the accompanying risks that that entails. Knowing how people tend to treat last orders, it seems more likely than not that the extra drinking up time acts as a de facto later closing and drinking time. So just uh, some final thoughts in relation to just hours of sale. Um, and I guess this is uh, us moving into just questions that the committee might want to think about. So first of all, I guess we've presented the evidence. It is pretty clear. Um, I guess you, you, know, you may have questions over whether it applies to Northern Ireland. The only way we would know that is by studying it, I think. But in a whole variety of cities in many countries, uh, it's, you, know, you find remarkably similar findings in relation to these later opening hours. Um, but I suppose just in terms of questions around the commercial imperative, bearing in mind the need to help hospitality to recover from the pandemic. Um, what, are the, what are the actual commercial drivers for this, I suppose? So which businesses is it that really want to open later? Uh, you know, do the smaller operators really want this? Is there a risk that it just costs them more to staff and they don't make any more money? And there are several ways in which that might be the case. So there's already an issue with people pre-drinking before they come to licensed premises. If they know the premises are open later, will they just uh, come out later? So, you know, you don't end up with actually extra staff being employed. They just all have to work later. 
or you uh, actually have a situation potentially where people just drink more before they come out and they actually arrive at premises drunker and so it creates more of a problem but then they're not actually buying much alcohol when they get there so it doesn't translate into that commercial benefit for the premises plus also if one premises in area wants to open later uh, that puts pressure on all the others to do so so that they don't lose custom even if they don't necessarily want to so i suppose i don't know who you've had um, submissions for, but I would just encourage you to consider whether smaller operators have also been included um, uh, and, you know, that their views are, are included in, in the kind of commercial arguments that might be being made for this as a form of recovery. So, Moving on then just to think about where alcohol can be purchased. I think I mentioned earlier that you know it, it's about convenience here. So if you have easy access and your nearest premises is very near you, if you've already had a few drinks, you might not be able to get in the car, but you run out of whatever you were drinking, you want to have some more. The nearer your premises is, the easier it is to, to get it. Um, but also this is about how many opportunities there are for you to purchase alcohol as you go about your daily business. So we're all at home just now, but normally on your way to work on, you know, as you go out throughout your day you know what are the um what's your exposure to that opportunity to purchase alcohol i suppose and so where this comes in i guess um is that the more outlets there are when we look at the evidence it shows that these mechanisms really hold so people drink more if there are more opportunities to drink um not just in terms of the timing but also in terms of of premises that are open at any given time um and what we also see is that deprived neighborhoods, even though uh, people in deprived communities tend to be abstinent more and they tend to drink less on a whole than wealthier communities, um, they actually tend to have relatively higher numbers of, of premises and higher alcohol related harms. So that's just some of the backdrop around kind of issues around where alcohol can be purchased. So what's in the proposed legislation on where alcohol can be purchased? Well, some of the new measures in the bill would increase spatial availability. For example, those designed to support special events, small producers and tourism. Uh, but to be honest, I think we're more concerned with protecting Northern Ireland's surrender principle um, and the proposed changes around opening hours and drinking up times and the effects of increased exposure to alcohol consumption and packaging on children and young people, which I'll cover come to shortly. Although the surrender principle that you have in place is not without its problems, small premises can be reopened as larger ones, and licenses can sometimes change hands for lots of money. It does prevent that proliferation of premises. And from a public health perspective, the Northern Ireland approach is a really good one. In the rest of the UK, we don't have such a mechanism for capping availability. And so as far as UK systems go, Northern Ireland's surrender principle is regarded as the best in terms of controlling spatial availability. Now, I mentioned about children and young people. There are a number of provisions within the bill that are directly relevant to children and young people, um, and some which, which we fully support. For example, the proposal to prohibit vending machines and the strengthening of current laws on the delivery of alcohol to young people. There are also several proposed measures, though, that do give rise to concerns, considering their potential impacts when you view them as a whole. And these are outlined on the slide here. So, for example, permitting certain premises to hold underage functions, providing specific conditions are met, um, permitting children and young people to be present at sporting clubs till 11 o'clock in the evening during summer months. I won't read them all. Um, but collectively, these would serve to increase children's exposure to alcohol consumption and product packaging, as there would be multiple additional opportunities for such exposure. And we'd urge you to carefully consider whether this is actually what you want to achieve, given that in Scotland and elsewhere in the UK, the focus is firmly on reducing children's exposure to product packaging and alcohol consumption too. Exposure to alcohol product packaging is positively related to consumption in children who are already drinking. And the evidence also clearly demonstrates that it increases the likelihood that children will begin drinking. In addition, it also increases children's knowledge of alcohol brands and slogans, helping to normalize alcohol at a young age. Concerns about normalisation were raised in our recent excellence study related specifically to children's exposure to alcohol on the morning school run as a result of early morning off-licence sales. 
But similar concerns regarding normalization would apply to the measures currently proposed. Children and young people are already frequently exposed to alcohol marketing via product packaging in their everyday lives and within their local environment. And so seeking to reduce exposure to alcohol packaging and consumption would better protect them from alcohol-related harms. And this is especially important given recent data that suggests almost a quarter of children in Northern Ireland aged between 11 and 16 are drinking, sometimes on a daily basis. In terms of price, we understand that there are some proposed measures in the bill to introduce restrictions on off-sale drink promotions in supermarkets, and that these proposed measures will serve to limit where promotions can be placed. But unless you take action to address how cheap alcohol is, you don't really begin to address issues of accessibility to alcohol. So in Scotland, we have two measures that have been introduced to try and tackle price and availability. The first of which is banning multi-buy promotions of alcohol as part of the Alcohol Act in 2011. And the second of which was our minimum unit pricing policy, which was introduced in May 2018. The evidence suggests that banning multi-buy promotions of alcohol has a relatively small impact on price and accessibility. But minimum unit pricing has a much more substantive impact on alcohol-related harms and is actually one of the most powerful tools at the disposal of governments to tackle the affordability of alcohol. So just to conclude then, um, I guess what we're encouraging you to do is to consider the changes in the bill as a whole um, and to, uh, to relate them not only to short-term effects in terms of policing and, and disorder and antisocial behaviour, but also to recognise that generally greater availability of alcohol leads to greater consumption, which will impact on those health harms that I know that you are concerned about in Northern Ireland. Um, the strongest evidence that we have uh, links not only that availability with consumption, but also does have links with those short-term harms around assaults and police ambulance involvement in ways that, is, um, that can't be observed, I think, just through frontline workers reporting. So, you know, they're in the studies where they have found these, evi uh, these evidence through robust methods, they have also interviewed police, interviewed um, uh, service providers, and they don't report seeing those changes. You can really only find those changes just through uh, designing studies that will look very carefully at the trends over time um, and measure actually the numbers of these uh, assaults and the numbers of these call outs. So it's not easy to just get it through speaking to people. Um, I suppose we all want to protect what's good about hospitality. We all want to be able to get back to coming together and relaxing in, in those um, social spaces and in bars and pubs. But I guess it's about uh, not just protecting the commercial interests of, uh, of those premises, but balancing that with both the short-term harms, but also the long-term harms and, and, and how you might protect public services, um, health services, as well as police services. Um, just to mention minimum unit pricing to follow on what Rachel said, uh, we have had some people in the trade, uh, particularly the pubs and bar trade in Scotland, actually tell us that they would like minimum unit the minimum youth price in Scotland to be significantly increased to deter people from home drinking and to, to I suppose, to balance up a bit more. So that might be a, a really positive measure that you could consider in, in future um, uh, in terms of actually encouraging people to go back to pubs and bars rather than sort of drinking at home, which is what they've been used to through COVID. And this was the other things that, again, are, are not within the direct um, uh, measures within the bill currently, but if you look at kind of best practice in relation to supporting the nighttime economy and, and recovery, it's not just about alcohol, it's about everything else that goes along with that. So what can be done to focus on arts and entertainments? What can be done essentially with the message of, you know, well, drinking less, but enjoying the nighttime economy more, being out, feeling safe. So considering, I suppose, how much uh, the alcohol factor within uh, that nighttime economy actually deters people from going out and enjoying those premises um, because of the potential for antisocial behaviour. And then I suppose we are researchers, you would probably say that we would say this, but I know that you've been discussing the potential for a one-year review. Um, I'm happy to, to discuss that further. Our, our view would be that a, that one year is not enough time to, uh, to analyse the data, to understand what has happened, um, and that you also need to plan for that in advance. So you need to be gathering data before any of these measures come in, in order to be able to compare the pre and post times. Um, so uh, yeah, happy to have further conversations around that to support 
uh, whether it's Queens or, or others in, in Northern Ireland to, to engage in that. And there is funding available from UK funders to do that kind of research. It is expensive, but it doesn't need to be funded by uh, by the government. That you know, there's research funding available. So um, yeah, just to, just really important to understand that we don't know everything and, and that you need to evaluate the what the changes. Okay. And that is everything from us. <laughs> Thank you so much, Nave and Rachel. I have I don't know what I have written down. I can't make sense of anything now that I've written down. I've scribbled that much down, um, well, which would be about right. Um, just to, uh, to clear up the matter you'd asked there about, uh, about smaller operators and had we had many uh, briefings or submissions from smaller operators, um, the way, as you would know, in Northern Ireland, um, we have uh, Hospitality Ulster. Um, that would be um, would speak on behalf of all of those, uh, whether large or small venues. And just on a point there, they had uh, when it came, I think it was the occasional licences. Um, they had asked that the smaller premises be in line with the larger premises, so they could have 104. Um, so I don't know whether that. Uh, so obviously that must be coming from the smaller venues that they want to be treated the same as the larger venues, uh, and having extensions to their opening up time. Um, I, I just I, I, the issue to do with the data sales. I find that quite shocking. Um, that we're not capturing. I think that's something we we actually do not do very well in Northern Ireland when it comes to gathering da data on anything. Um, we're pretty poor. Um, there, so we are, and I suppose uh, th that data sales, uh, if we're not capturing that, um, I, I mean, did you to, who did you say that goes to directly again? If you could just remind me. Um, so th it's available through commercial data providers, is my understanding. So Nielsen is one of the companies. So you have to purchase the data and then you have to analyze it when you've purchased it. So um, that's something that's routinely done in some other parts of the UK. So in Scotland, the um, Public Health Scotland agency would purchase that data and regularly publish analysis of, of the trends in relation to sales. It's the most robust measure of consumption because everything else is self-reported which is just subject to so many other um other i suppose influences whereas this is just how much alcohol is sold and it's a very good proxy for how much alcohol is drunk and Niamh, do you know if that is purchased here by our public health agency or by the department of fair communities i don't think so if it's purchased it's not published which means that we can't use it but um uh, I haven't had a conversation with them. I, I actually asked a colleague who was involved in doing analysis uh, for Northern Ireland in relation to minimum unit pricing, and he was able to confirm that that there isn't currently data available that we could draw on to inform this presentation, um, and that he thinks it hasn't been purchased. But I'd need to have another conversation, I think, with the public health agency. So it was new, it was news to me as well this week. I was surprised. Yeah, because if we and you mentioned it there, as we're talking about the, the review, which we have several witness sessions have brought up the review. Um, so if if the department or the uh, or PHA don't have this at their fingertips when we come to the review, then a year down the line, even of of sales data, um, that will make that a bit impossible. When you say that we need to have data now, we need to have gathered lots of data by now to start a review in a year's time. Um, so some of the data might already be there. So th that sales data will exist because it's HMRC data, it's tax data. So it will exist. Um, it's just that, uh, yeah, it, uh, it needs to be obtained, I suppose. So it's not that it'll disappear if you don't do it now. And then the rest, it takes just a little bit of work to work out exactly how, say, assaults are recorded in the police data sets, how are ambulance call outs recorded in a way that you might be able to identify which ones are alcohol related. But those sorts of issues are common across other jurisdictions and there are ways around them to try to get robust data but it just takes a bit of planning i guess that that was the point you can i suppose look back so if you know what data you need sometimes you can be lucky enough that it's already there and you've gathered it and you can go backwards but um but it would be worth looking at it sooner rather than later in case there needs to be tweaks to how that data is collected to make it robust enough to use in a review and I think that is the issue. It's how the data is collected. Um, I worked for the health service, and I, I was on health committee here for many years. And when we looked at even various aspects of health, whether that was suicide or whatever else that might be, how, da how data is actually collected um, does not necessarily correlate with the issues at hand. Um, so it, it, you're, I think you're very right there. Um, we don't always collect the data in the way that we need it. Um, you know whether it's its cause of admission to A and E is through alcohol, though it might be it's captured that the cause the, the admission to A and E was because of a knock to the head, 
and alcohol is not mentioned on the on the data gathering. You know, and it's the same with police arrests. It might be um, a, a, a police arrest due to um, behaviour of some sort, but it might not be that the, the cause of this was alcohol. Um, it, it, whenever they're they do, they're collecting the data, so I think that's a really important um, issue that needs to be sorted. Um, if we're looking at a review of that, um, I just wanted then to ask you, or just uh, I've that many things written down here. I don't know what I want to ask you. Um, the the the, the multi buy issue. I know you you know the the minimum unit pricing is not likely to come into force here until the next mandate um, of the assembly. So that's still some time away. Um, I mean that is a couple of years away um, before we will see that. The 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 multi buying though I would would not necessarily fall under that that could fall it could fall under this bill um did you say that it didn't make a major difference um and i assume by multi-buying you're talking about and uh, forgive me if i'm absolutely wrong here um where we would see in some of our larger supermarkets where you would get buy six get 25 percent off and all of these various offers that are encouraging you to to buy more though in saying that I would say the vast majority of people that do do that, they're, they're responsible drinkers, albeit they're stockpiling. Is that what you're talking about? Yes, I'll hand over to Rachel on the evidence on that, I think. But just on the, the comment about the responsible drinkers, I suppose it's just to go back to that issue that if you stockpile, you probably drink more. I think we're all a bit like that. If it's in the house, you're more likely to drink it. And even though you're drinking responsibly, that still leads to the harms and the deaths down the road in, in some of those people. So in your health figures, that will still show up, even if the drinking's totally responsible. So I, I well, I'll hand over to Rachel on the... I think on the maybe evidence. Dave, I'm trying to tell myself that that is a responsible drinker. <laughs> I think yeah. we all try to do that a little bit. <laughs> sorry. So I think, sorry, I think in terms of the evidence that we have in Scotland, it would suggest that the banning of multi buy promotions had a small impact on creating an environment where alcohol is sold more responsibly. But there are a couple of studies that have been done that showed slightly different things. So, for example, one study that showed that banning multi-buy promotions didn't actually reduce alcohol purchasing in the short term. And the industry appeared to respond to the ban by replacing multi-buy with a simple price reduction, which made it possible for consumers to buy alcohol at a discounted price still, but with a smaller financial outlay. So in many ways, this mitigated the intended effects of the policy. But there's other evidence that has been gathered to suggest that the uh, the ban on, on multi-buy promotions was associated with reduced sales of off-trade wine and pre-mixed alcohol drinks, which were the ones that were most likely to be bought as part of a multi-buy deal in Scotland before the legislation was introduced. So I think on balance, we feel it can have a small impact, but, but it's it's not really the, the solution. Yeah. And then just on, follow on from that, I know you had mentioned there, because you'd heard, heard, heard previous um, briefings to do with the advertising. And I think, I mean, personally, I'd love to see all advertising banned on any of our sports grounds, especially. Um, I don't think it. Uh, I don't think it's conducive to sport either. Um, to see alcohol promotion everywhere, um, but there's also then the issue around the the alcohol advertising within our supermarkets. And uh, again, it's been brought up by some of uh, some of our witness sessions, where you would have the likes of, for example, Marks and Spencers, or the other other supermarkets are available. Um, that would do. You know, you're dining in for two. And they're advertising there in the middle of the store, the you know your bottle of wine and all of the rest of that. Um, it, it's just that d d does that make a marked difference if that stuff if that is removed? So I think uh, it's to look at the whole system and all of these little things make a difference. Um, so I suppose what you want is to move more towards a, a situation in which people have the freedom to drink or not drink but it's not kind of in their faces all the time so the parents also it, you know their children are not exposed to it so i guess whereas what we have just now is whether you look at greeting cards or you look at the adverts in the stores or you look at the number of premises and so on it's just everywhere and that's what children in scotland have, have been looking into the children's parliament in scotland have looked into and they've just kind of said it's just everywhere and so anything that reduces that is seen as a positive in terms of ultimately protecting children and young people from future consumption. And also, I suppose, just trying to help everybody um, potentially to, to drink less, but, but be able to enjoy that more. 
And that doesn't necessarily mean lower sales for commercial operators. So what you find with minimum unit pricing is that people spend actually a little bit more money on alcohol than they did before. So sales go up for in terms of revenues for commercial operators, but they're buying better quality products and they're paying for better quality products. So it's a, it is that kind of sweet spot, I suppose, of, of drinking less but enjoying it more. And just before I bring in members, and just to say I've got Mark and Kelly, our two members that are waiting, um, it, it's just then um, following on from that, we, we as a committee are going to be holding um, a consultation with young people. Um, I, I can't remember that's next week or the week after, um, or we'll have young people, and, and those are the questions we'll maybe want to ask them as well about those influences. But just to ask you around the bill itself, um, do you see any positives within the bill as it stands at the moment when it comes to teaching children responsible um, socialising and responsible drinking? So Rachel might be better placed to uh, to answer this than me, and I think you're more familiar with the details of of the measures. But the, there certainly are measures in there that we wouldn't oppose in relation to you know pre preventing vending machines, you know uh, the online deliveries to young people, and so on. Um, I think in some ways. Uh, I suppose it, within public health, there's a movement away from thinking about teaching children to drink alcohol responsibly, and really just uh, because actually there, there isn't really any evidence for that as actually an approach that protects them. So you know the idea of parents giving children alcohol in a controlled environment when they're underage. Uh, there's no you know, the the thinking and the evidence is that actually that's not a good idea that that we should be teaching children that alcohol is a is a product that is a drug and that it you know that they need to treat it carefully and that there's a time when they will be old enough to to drink it and you know whatever age that is is I suppose a parental judgment but but I think the thinking has moved away from the idea that that that's a good thing to do that actually it's seen as just kind of normalising it rather than um, rather than teaching them to drink responsibly but in terms of the specific measures I'll, I'll admit, Rachel you're probably better placed to Answer. Well, I mean, Nave, I would probably largely echo what you've said. I think the um, proposed measures in the bill that, that we would support and feel supportive of are around the prohibition of vending machines and the strengthening of current laws on the delivery of alcohol to young people. Those are the two proposed measures that I think would be in line with, with our sort of suggestions around um, sort of almost better protection of children when it comes to exposure to alcohol um, product packaging and, and consumption. And I think the issue of product packaging, as Neve said, um, it's, it is everywhere. Um, so any steps that can be taken to try and reduce that, I think are absolutely key, given that the evidence clearly demonstrates that when children are exposed to alcohol brands and slogans, it helps to normalise alcohol for them at a very early age. Yeah, no, thank you for that. I, I, I just actually just one more comment, and it was around the, the protecting the surrender principle. Um, I suppose it's it's good to know that there's something that we're doing right here, or what is seen as right by the rest of, of the United Kingdom. Um, just then, on issues are on that as well. Then, if we look at the rest of the UK and the Republic of Ireland, um, what, uh, do they have unlimited then amounts of licences that are handed out, or what way does does it work? And you know, um, we, we've we've heard it said here, and certainly in committee, that we have less licences now than we had. Um, 100 years ago when Northern Ireland was formed. So, yeah, it, it's just that, it, it, what, what's it like in the rest of the UK and Ireland? Yeah, so in so the systems are fairly different between Scot fairly similar, sorry, between Scotland and England and Wales, um, and I'm a bit less familiar with the Republic of Ireland system. But in Scotland, uh, the licensing system has objectives, and um, one of those objectives, which is different from England, is protecting and improving public health. Um, and in theory, that should mean that. Uh, public health um, practitioners and, and the police can object to a license being granted. Um, but in practice, most licenses, new licenses are still granted. So, you know, at best, you can potentially, in theory, stop new licenses being granted. But in reality, there are thousands of new licenses being granted all the time across the UK. So I think the systems in in England, Wales and, and Scotland, from in terms of their achieving their aims, are seen as being a bit broken that actually it's very very difficult to do more 
uh, to do anything really around availability and that uh, perhaps you have more success around about if you focus on uh, changing the nature of the premises so kind of place shaping around encouraging arts venues encouraging restaurants that you can sometimes have more success around that but you but all, but it's very difficult to do anything about actually just how many premises there are there's no cap I mean, that for us, for me, actually hearing that is re sounds really very strange as someone who sat on council for a number of years when it came to transfer of licences and things like that. It sounds very strange that it can be absolutely unlimited in the amount of, of licensed premises. Very yeah, I mean, it's gotten to the stage now, I think, in, in Scotland and England, Wales, that our numbers of premises per head of population are, are so high that they're, that actually adding extra premises is not actually making a massive difference to harms because the alcohol is just so available anyway that we have to go quite a long way in the other direction before we would see a reduction in harms. And, and I think that's also seen as being why it's, uh, the licensing system is kind of tinkering around the edges around harms and is still really quite permissive. It's really about just sort of giving licenses to responsible people rather than actually sort of focusing on the overall impact in terms of alcohol. Okay, look, thank you. I am going to open up for me up to members. I've got Mark and then I've got Kelly. So Mark, if you want to come in. Thank you, Chair, and thanks to Rachel and, and Neve for that uh, session and, and for the submission. I have a couple of questions, Chair. I was thinking I'll just run through the questions rather than just get involved in the game of back and forth or, or, or verbal tennis here, and, and then the, the ladies can, can answer them as, as they see fit. Uh, I'll start when you finished off, Chair, and that was on the surrender principle. The, the submission refers to the surrender principle as constraining the spatial availability of alcohol. But does the spatial availability measure take into account the reality of people drinking in uncontrolled environments or the uncontrolled environment of, of, of home or, or, or private premises? Also, you conclude that there's clear evidence that greater availability tends to lead to greater consumption and harms. How can the effect of extended opening hours be considered in isolation from just wider societal changes? And, and, and that's something we, we've discussed here before. Yeah, yeah. Another issue, and there's been a wee bit of back and forth on this already, but I think we should, of course, distinguish between children and young people being exposed to responsible alcohol consumption and being exposed to alcohol abuse and the normalisation of that. Do you have any insights into how children and, for example, I suppose France or, or Mediterranean countries fare in terms of alcohol issues? And just to sum up or, or a final question, over the past number of weeks or, or months or however long we've been going through this, we've had conflicting views on whether increase in drinking uptime encourages people to drink more or instead not feel the need to purchase as much drink and, and consume it as quickly. You said there's little or no evidence on this, but you worry about enforcement. I was just wondering if maybe you could expand on that a wee bit, please. Sure. Okay. I'll take them one at a time. I think I have a note of them. So um, uh, where does home drinking or drinking in unregulated environments fit within this idea of spatial availability? I suppose what we see and what we've seen in relation to COVID and curfews and, and a lot of the debates that we have about alcohol is that, um, that there is always a minority that will find a way to do the thing you're trying to stop people from doing. But your measures are usually pretty effective for the majority. Um, so I suppose having more licensed premises isn't the best mechanism to get people to move from homes into licensed premises. If people, you know, I would question whether the motivation for drinking at home or the motivation for drinking in unregulated environments is because there isn't a premises available um, or there aren't enough premises available. I think it's different things having an impact there. But, um, but say, for example, with, uh, I suppose, when premises were closed due to COVID, of course, there are some people that will go and have parties, but most people won't. So you still get the benefit of the policy. And yes, there's some unintended consequences, but it doesn't override the benefits. So that's generally what we see. Um, in terms of extended opening hours, yeah, so I guess 
what I would say here is, again, the Norway study is really interesting in this because that was 18 cities where some of them expanded their opening hours, some of them reduced it. The societal issues were the same across the, the country. It wasn't like there was some stuff going on in the ones where we saw the harms and that might not have been there in the others. So the studies are very well designed to allow, to ensure that if you draw a conclusion that you're not um, incorrectly drawing that conclusion when it might be caused by wider societal issues. So there's all sorts of techniques that are used statistically in, in the analysis to, to take account of whether you know, this might be just a trend due to wider society. So you can use control areas, you can use um, uh, time series analysis, and then you can just sort of look at, you know, is there any reason to think that you know, there was some other change in society that happened right at the time when we extended these opening hours that would better explain this, the significant effects that we see than the actual change that we know about. So, um, that's how that is handled. It's not perfect, but but it is considered. Um, in France and the Mediterranean in relation to responsible alcohol consumption and children. So what we have seen historically in France um, in particular um, is that they had lower levels of antisocial behavior than we would have had here, but really high levels of alcohol consumption and the highest in Europe levels of alcohol specific deaths as a result. Yep. Um, so they did introduce people to alcohol much younger. It was normal in the workplace and everything else, but their population consumption was massive. It was probably more responsible drinking than we have here in the short term, but caused long term problems. What they've done in France is, is ban all alcohol advertising, and they've also got um, price control measures in place, so they encourage the industry to stop selling the really cheap wine that was just, uh, you know, um, sort of you know, not homebrew, but community, community, community vineyards and that kind of thing. So yeah. the price of alcohol has, has gone up in France. Um, and people are just drinking less, but, you know, better quality stuff. And they have managed to reduce um, with those measures their, their alcohol-related liver disease and deaths quite significantly. So there's a really big impact in France of that. But they're one of the sort of really early adopters in terms and of banning advertising. Frame, has that been the... I would need to have a look. I, I, so we have a colleague, actually, who's done a lot of work in studying the ban on advertising in France, Nathan Critchlow, who would act, he's actually really our expert in terms of alcohol advertising, um, who I'd be happy, you know, I'm sure he would be happy to come and speak to you. But um, I would suspect it's over 10 to 15 years, but that's, uh, that, uh, yeah, don't take me as, uh, as gospel on that. Um, and then I think your last question was just about the drinking up time. So I was yeah. I was tuned in this morning when um, uh, when uh, Assistant Chief Constable McEwen was speaking, and it was really interesting to hear what he was saying. Um, I think I suppose it, it's hard to see knowing the culture of last orders anyway in licensed premises. How having longer to drink after last orders wouldn't mean that people order more. So. You know, you've got, to, I suppose, counter here that you might have some people for whom some premises for whom the people drift out of the premises slowly, but you might just as easily have other premises where everybody buys three pints at you know an hour before drinking and and has to drink them really fast in the next hour. So, um, so I think in terms of the short term effect, those two might counteract each other, but in the longer term, you're essentially giving people more time to drink alcohol. So they're likely to drink more, and that is likely to increase your consumption. And even if it doesn't affect those short-term issues, it, you, you'd expect to see that in the health harms later. Okay, no, no, thank you, Eve. I just want to go back to, to my first question again, that was the one uh, on the surrender principle and dealing with the, with the lockdown-related example, of, of a, a different example, but you used the example of people going to party, and I know. And I know that was around the spread of COVID as opposed to the consumption of alcohol. My concern is people don't have to go to parties. If they consume alcohol, they can do it on their own, in their own house. And I, I accept uh, some of the points you've made, certainly, about the, the, the surrender principle and the, the spatial availability issue. But my concern that I've expressed previously here in committee, and I think some others have concurred, is that when, say, in a rural village where there might be one licensed premises that's not a big profit-making enterprise by, by any stretch of the imagination, when the landlord decides it's time to, to throw in the towel or, or hang up the towel, that, uh, you know, really the only offer there might be coming from a, a Tesco's or a Express or, or a spa or that to buy the license off them. So then you'll have no controlled premises in that village for the consumption of alcohol 
and the, the, the patrons who might have frequented it a night or two a week will now not have that option, but they will have a big Euro Spa or, or Tesco Express that they can go to and buy a bottle of wine or a, a, a box of cans every night of the week. So I think we would share your concerns about that, and um, so uh, that's uh, I, I'm not I wasn't aware of exactly how the surrender principle works in relation to off and on license sales. So that's really interesting. Um, so it's I suppose what I would say, yeah, it, it's not. Um, so I I wonder if thinking about tweaking it rather than abandoning it is the way to handle some of those kind of anomalies, so that you might say that a non-licensed premises has to, it license has to be can only be used for another on licensed mm -hmm. premises and can't be used for an off license you can also um, have limits on the floor space for alcohol within off licensed premises so that's been looked at in the highlands in scotland through some of our legislation um and i think uh you know, so I think it's it's working out creative ways to protect what the surrender principle does do without having those kind of anomalies, which, you know, we would see a pub as being overall uh, likely to cause less harm in the longer term yeah. than a big supermarket in terms of alcohol sales. Yeah, I think I wonder if there's a way of kind of rural proofing it almost, because this is, I think, more a, a, a rural uh, problem. Okay, thanks, Amelia. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Mark. Um, Thank you. Can I then ask uh, for Kelly to be brought in? Thank you very much, Chair, and thank you very much, um, Nave and Rachel. Um, your your presentation has certainly um, helped to um, remind me just how serious this matter is and that we need to get it right. Just um, following on from what Mark was talking to you about there, about the surrender principle, what has shocked me through um, our committee sessions has been that when we asked for a list of all of the you know, licensed premises across Northern Ireland, now our researchers were able to come up with a map, which was maps so i was very grateful to see that but when, when you consider the surrender principle and spatial availability one of the issues that we do have is, is because there isn't that collection of data and um, we don't even have a list of all those licensed premises kept in one place and um, you can definitely see from the maps that people can apply for a, if there's a license available for them to apply for and they can be put, those licenses can be um allowed to gather up in certain areas. I know you can imagine a city like Belfast or up in Derry or any of the larger towns, you know, you would see a larger number of pubs, but it's when you add into that those places, other places where you can buy alcohol, you start to see concentrations. And that has a little bit of a concern for me on the on the surrender principle because if if we allow that to go uncontrolled, then we just build up more and more problems in particular areas. Um, on the alcohol sales data, I'm shocked, absolutely shocked, that, you know, as a, a government, we can't produce any information on that. Um, can I just ask, uh, Neve, did you say that it was Public Health Scotland um, that produced the data on the Nielsen so they, they buy the Nielsen, the data from Nielsen, they're a commercial company, and then they analyze it, yeah. Okay, so now I, I want to just be cautious in saying that I obviously haven't spoken to it. So just in case I'm landing the public health agency in it and they maybe do analyze this, but it certainly isn't available publicly at the moment. And I haven't seen anything published to tell us what the trends are. So I was trying to see if, you know, it would have been nice to have a graph alongside the, not nice, but the deaths that we were able to see that trend in deaths to see, you know, is consumption rising at the same time or is there something else causing those deaths? Now, we would expect that it's consumption related, but um, but we don't have the data to, to show. Yeah, um, no, it's 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 one of those things, as, as the chair said earlier, um, without data, how can you prove or how can you disprove, you know, what we, we think we know, um, it's, it's vital. I think that's something that we may have to consider. One of the other things that was on one of your slides is that you've said that um, arts and entertainment should not be alcohol focused. Couldn't agree more with that. And this is where I have a bit of an issue because we've heard from people that having the entertainment license and the you know the license to sell alcohol um, run together so that both would end at the same time does sort of sound as if we are putting the focus on entertainment with 
um, alcohol licensing. So I'm just wondering, um, what are your thoughts? Should we keep that separate so that those who have entertainment can continue to have your entertainment license irrespective of the license to sell alcohol? Or do you think that, that it's, it's safer for those to be kept together? So I am not 100% sure. I don't have a strong view either way. I guess in principle, you would want people to be able to provide entertainment without having an alcohol license. So I don't know if it's, I'm not sure exactly what the technical details of it are. Um, can people opt out of the alcohol license and still have the arts and entertainment bit, but it's just combined. So I'm not quite sure, but um, but yeah, I think where, so what I've seen in terms of some of the work that's been done in some boroughs of London and places like that is um, it's quite a long-term approach to sort of planning for a town or a city to say, right, you know, how can we work with business communities in this place to transform our nighttime economy to see it as being a completely different thing from the daytime economy and for that not to just be about alcohol for that to be about you know what are the kind of light shows that are put on in the winter that families and children can go to late you know up to 10 11 o'clock at night that are you know nothing to do with alcohol really but um but are you know a form of, of entertainment that just brings in that revenue creates that employment but it but doesn't have as much in relation to the harms associated with it so that's just one example, and okay, I, one of the there are others I could recommend to speak to you more about that if you were really interested. Yeah, um, one of the things that was of interest to me is when ICC, um, sorry, McCune was talking to us earlier, um, there was a mention of the, the late night levy. And I appreciate that um, it was mentioned in the context that this could potentially raise income. Um, or or local authority, but I'm actually wondering: is there any evidence anywhere of that late night levy being used in GB um, to fund alcohol prevention programs or health programs? Yeah, so I actually looked that up when I realised I didn't know the answer to a question that was asked earlier on it. So um, on the late night levy, um, I think the question earlier was, uh, how is it set? So it, it excludes hotels and village pubs and it's uh, and a few other venues like theatres and things, but it's set at a rate that's proportionate to the rateable value of the premises. So just to cover off that question. Um, but yes, at the in, the in England and Wales where this applies, um, it's introduced on a local basis. 70% of the levy goes to the police currently that's mandated and the other 30 percent goes to the licensing authority in the local council so in you know, our our licensing is is led by local authorities local governments um so it goes to that 30 percent of it goes to the local government and then they disperse that as they see fit really so they can disperse it on anything to do with alcohol so they could fund prevention activities the, obviously the 70 30 is is arbitrary and you know you, you could decide what was right for northern ireland if you were doing that um, i should also say just that Sorry, just to add to that whilst I think of it, um, I think that there have been some areas where the late night levy has been challenged. So as far as I understand, it's been used on a relatively limited basis. So I know Newcastle have it. I think there, um, Islington in London have it. So there's about sort of seven or eight areas out of a couple of hundreds who've, who have introduced it in England and Wales. It hasn't been um, massively taken up. So and I'm not sure exactly why that is, but um, but I think you know it's been in place for quite a long time in those areas. Okay, very interesting. Uh, one of the, the last thing, and this is, it's not in your paper, but it's something that's just hit me. Um, your, your paper does talk about you know, the amount of incidents that can happen. It talks to us about the, the drunkenness, the assaults, the injuries, the sort of ambulance in place that, that have to um, come on scene after people get out of bars and restaurants, especially if a lot of alcohol has been taken. I'm just wondering, um, with regards to those licensed premises, at the moment, the, as happens in so many places, um, once a person is outside the door of that premises, the licensee has no responsibility for them. But should, the, should we be considering the footfall around a licensed premises as still being within the responsibility of the licensee? So for you know it might only be um you know five years or something of a licensed premises and um, we currently have it in public transport um where if someone for instance gets off a, a public transport bus and falls within three feet of a bus then it's within the insurance claim of that that bus uh, but if someone comes out of a, a bar and there isn't 
a responsibility for the license holder to manage what happens outside their, their, their premises, then that's where assaults can happen and injury and ambulances are called. Um, I know that licensees will not want that to happen directly outside their premises because it will give it a bad image, but any evidence of licenses being extended to include um, almost like an apron around licensed premises that means that licensees would have to take responsibility there. So I, I I was losing you a little bit during that. So, but I think I've got the gist of the question. So, I um, my understanding is that uh, that there's some evidence around kind of uh, I think it's called like last drinks responsibility. So it's where if somebody is injured or responsible for a crime and the last place that they drunk uh, and the last place that served them alcohol can be held responsible. So that's kind of legal liability thing. I think there are quite mixed views around that. Um, but it, so not exactly what you're what you're asking about. But there are other things that are, I suppose, more normal um, in in Wales and in other places where. So two things that I can think of. One is that in uh, I share your concern about not having a database it's about licensed premises. We have very poor data in other parts of the UK too. Uh, it seems to somehow evade our <laughs> systems to actually know what premises are operating at any given time. Um, but what we do have is a police database. Um, called Innkeeper in Scotland, where any police incidents um, are recorded on this database, including what the last premises was that, uh, that the person was drinking in. So it allows uh, the police, I suppose, to identify where they might need to go out and do maybe a bit more of a supportive visit or do a little bit more monitoring about a premises if there's multiple incidents coming up related to that premises. So that's um, Innkeeper. In Cardiff, there's a thing called the Cardiff model, which is um, A&E departments working out where someone was drinking before they come in with an alcohol-related problem into the A&E department. Um, and, uh, and then I think, again, kind of outreach to those premises to... Uh, it's, it's a kind of a form of identifying, I suppose, potential problem premises. Um, because what we still see, which I suppose goes back to our concern about enforcement of the drinking uptime, um, is that... Um, that there are really long established laws saying that you can't sell alcohol to a drunk person. But when we do mystery shopper studies, pubs and bars sell alcohol to drunk people all the time, uh, some more and some less, but it's, but it's really high levels that we see. And so with the best will in the world, it's hard for premises to say no to people if they're trying to buy alcohol. And so I think that's where there could be more support. There's some evidence around kind of measures that can help with that. And I think that's also where our concern is a little bit about the drinking uptime. If there's a pressure on a hard pressed pub owner to just, oh, come on, we've got an hour to drink up. Can we not all have another pint? It's pretty hard unless you're really going to invest a lot in enforcement to actually pick up on that and prevent it from happening. And you can understand in, in COVID recovery why there would be a lot of pressure on them to, to do that. No, that's brilliant. Thank you so much for your time and your paper. Um, it's, pardon the pun, quite sobering um, when you make the reading through. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Kelly, no other member has um, signified that they want to ask anything further. So I can I just say a very big thank you to both yourselves, uh, Neve and Rachel, for coming in here today. You've probably given us more more questions and answers now as well for the department when we get around your deliberations. Um, but very much, very much worthwhile evidence session. So thank you so much. Thank you very much for having us. Thanks for having us. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. OK, members, we still have a heck of a lot to get through, but what I'm going to do is we have an SL1 and an SR to do. I'm going to do both of those um, before I go back to matters hey, arising. OK, Sinead, is that Sinead talking? Um, just to remind members, every one of you has been brought into the spotlight so I can hear you all. Um, whoever is having a conversation there, we can hear you. <laughs> so uh, you're all live again. Um, what I was saying there is I'm going to going to just move on to our SL1 and our an SR that we have just to get those done before I go back to matters arising because I'm quite conscious there's a lot there and I want to get uh, I want to allow these other two issues to, to, to go through first. So can I then um, ask you to turn to your tabled paper where you'll find the SL1, the COVID-19 Heating Payment Scheme Amendment Regulations, Northern Ireland 2021. You'll find that this page five of your table paper. Um, the department now proposes that the scheme is extended to include those in receipt of benefits which are deemed to overlap 
with the Social Security benefits currently included in the eligibility for the COVID-19 heating payment scheme. This would extend the scheme to include those receiving the two highest rates of constant <coughs> attendance allowance paid through their industrial industries disablement benefit or the war pension scheme, the war pension pensioners mobility supplement and the armed forces independent payment. The current planning assumption is that the amendment regulations will come into operation on the 4th of March 2021 and the rule will be submitted to the committee at the same time as it is sent to the Assembly Business Office for laying. So I'm just going to ask if members any comment or content, Andy? Yeah, sure. Can I just declare an interest at the outset in, in respect to this? Um, and just um, if members are in agreement, I would like, obviously, given that this uh, originated from this committee, um, us to convey our, our appreciation to the department for taking on board our concerns to the department and the minister because they have taken our, our concerns on board and, and rightly as promised they've addressed them. So I think it's only right we acknowledge that. Yeah, no, thank you. I agree with you. Absolutely, Andy. Uh, Kelly, you wanted to ask something? Yes, uh, one of my concerns has been there is a, a, a huge backlog of people who are waiting for appeals at the moment. Um, I had asked the Minister um, to confirm if those people who are awaiting appeal are then subsequently successful in that appeal and their award is backdated that to the to the time that this payment was made. Um, the Minister has said that that will happen. It's not mentioned here, but my concern would be if the money is not available, whenever those appeals are heard, which could be in another two, three, four months time or longer, um, that those people will not actually get this heating payment. So I think just as committee, if we can go back and just confirm that the money will be, have they worked out how many people are currently waiting on appeals who, if they were successful, could qualify for this um, and make sure that that money set aside for those people. I know that we did receive a letter from the Minister. We did get it in writing from the Minister um, and from the Department to say that those people will be paid retrospectively. Um, so we certainly do have that on, in writing. Um, but if you want further clarification on that, um, we certainly can do that. Because I do know there is a, a mammoth amount of, of people that are waiting on those appeals. Um, but I know we certainly have it in writing as a committee and it has been read through the committee minutes as well that those people would receive their retrospective yeah. payments. Um, Andy, do you then maybe if we link that? I, I follow okay. this up with the department also, and, and, and my understanding that's already been factored into the department's consideration of this um, as part of the wider um, heating payment, the, 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 the budget that they had originally, and they'd already factored that in because obviously if somebody goes through the appeal and then they get their, if they're successful, they're, they would then have a live award. So the department said they were already alert to that. So that has that been factored into their so budget then? That's what I've been told. It's been You've factored been in that? from the, the, the engagement I've had with um, the department directly on this. Okay. Well, maybe just then we'll just ask for that to be that the information that was given to Andy then around that, if it could be then just shared with the committee, and that way um, it'll Save come to. through. It'll come through yeah. our committee um, uh, letters then, so it's on the record. Um, I've just had the same. As you've had the same yeah. as well as Andy Robin. Right. The so only it's thing definitely. I would say, Chair, is I've had that confirmation verbally, so um, I don't have anything don't written have down. I, I'm happy to go back to the, the, my contact and, 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 and see if I can get that right and put it through the, the committee yeah. system. Uh, either way, that would do. Yeah, yeah. And I think Andy's absolutely right. I think this is something that the, yeah. the minister um, heard what uh, the committee had to say, and certainly Andy has to be given credit for this as well because he has championed this from the very beginning um, and so it's just to say thank you to her and I mean she did give me her word on a telephone call a few weeks ago that <coughs> it would happen and it has happened so I think we, as a committee we need to pass that on most definitely. Um, so members are then, so we're content then um, that uh, they, yeah. the department go ahead with that. Okay, I'm then going to ask you then to move to agenda item 9 which is SR 2021-38, the Pension Protection Fund on Occupational Pension Schemes Levy Sealing Order Northern Ireland 2021. You'll find this at page 165 of your mm. meeting pack. Can I ask members, have you any objections to this rule? No mm. objections? Nope. Okay. Then I'll put the following, that the Committee for Communities has considered SR 2021-38, the Pension Protection Fund 
an occupational pension schemes levy ceiling order Northern Ireland 2021 and subject to the examiner of statutory rules report has no objection to the rule. Okay members we're going to then go into reverse and go all the way back to our matters arising. Oh, who's dogs barking? Um, <laughs> can you hear a dog barking? Um, okay, I think we're starting off at seven. It's not eight. Oh, eight. Have we done seven? Oh, ha no, we haven't. No, we haven't done seven. No, we well, haven't. Know. Yeah, see, Sorry, I was, I was right. You were right, I don't know. <laughs> okay, members, we're going Jerry's to the... Jerry's always right. I yes. am always right. <laughs> Just ask Sorry. everybody I live with. Even um, that she's wrong. <laughs> <laughs> members, if I could ask you then to turn to page 46 of your meeting pack, where you'll see a departmental response on meetings with the voluntary and community sector. Um, the department is not currently undertaking a formal review of the 2011 Concordia, but recognises the need for a strategic recovery and renewal agenda for the sector. Um, members, have you any comments? Are you content to note this at present? Content to note? Yeah? Yeah. Okay. Then can yeah. I ask you then, well, number eight then, is it page 48 of your meeting pack where you'll see a departmental response in relation to COVID support? For large leisure and entertainment businesses, the department has said it's not aware of any proposals to develop a specific funding package for the large entertainment and leisure sector, including cinemas, and given the range of activity that might fall within that definition, it would be a case um, it would be in any case seem to extend beyond the DFC remit. In November, Omniplex submitted an application to the Arts Council Stability and Renewal Programme for organisations. That application has now been assessed by the Arts Council and the Department understands that an offer of grant has been made um, to Omniplex. Can I then ask members any comments are content to note that? We will, of course, send that response on to, I think it was Movie House and Omniplex had brought that to our attention, but we'll send that on. Are members content to note then that, yes? Yeah. Okay. Then number nine is at page yes. 50, page fifty of your pack, where you'll see a departmental departmental response in relation to COVID sports funding. This is the the uh, that <laughs> has been rumbling on and on and on and on. I'm not going to read out everything that it says here, but I I I am satisfied at present. Um, that both the Minister for the Communities and Minister for Finance um, seem to have got together on this and they're looking at those that have seemed to have slipped through the net. Um, I, I think the committee will still keep it under their watch because it is important. But and I know certainly I had put a question down to the minister for question time on Monday, which didn't it, it didn't get to me. Um, but I have received the written response on that, and he is certainly aware that there are um, sporting clubs that have fallen through the net here, um, and that they are they are actively um, looking to see how they can support them in that. Um, Andy, do you want to come in? Sure. Um, just obviously in relation to this, um, we we have correspondence from the minister of finance in our table packs as well relates to this and the minister's highlighted that um, obviously the reconsideration process to the, the LRSS scheme. Can, if members are content, can we go back to the minister and clarify whether there has been a directive um, sent out to those um, administering the reconsideration process that any applicant who has not been successful under the Sports Sustainability Fund should be considered under LRSS? Yep, I think that's a very good idea that we, we do, right? I know I had one last week again. Another one that I've written to, um, which just happens, it's a factory club that just happens to have athletics in their name. They have no sports grounds or nothing to do with sport, but they were turned down by LRSS because they just happen to have that in their name. Um, so, I mean, and, and I've heard of others, um, all the various clubs right across um, Belfast, certainly, um, from all parts of our communities that have been turned down because they just happen to have the name of a sports club or the name of a sport in their name, but they're actually just a social club. Um, so I think Andy, you make a good point, and we'll write back in and ask for clarification on that. Members, content then we move on from that one? Yeah, Great. yeah, yeah. Okay. Great. Where are we? Number 10, yeah. Um, sorry. Oh, sorry, did you want me to mention something else, sir? Yeah, sorry, go ahead, who was looking in? It's Ali, sorry. Um, Chair, I was just going to say the Minister has announced today that the Sports Sustainability Fund has started to make payments. Um, okay. They have said in their letter that at that stage the officials should be in a position to start to provide detailed information. Um, if we could just ask the Department, um, obviously the payments are going <coughs> excuse me, out at the moment, but um, if we could get a breakdown on, on who has been awarded the funding, that would be very helpful. 
Yeah, I think that that was... That was a note just there. Just yeah, the it's a note it. that had been written for me here that I didn't read out. See, I'm trying, I'm trying to shorten the meeting for you, so you're <laughs> absolutely right. Um, yeah, that's okay. All right, members, good that we move on. Um, I think, what, oh, I'm supposed to, supposed to ask you, were you content to receive a briefing on the Sports Sustainability Fund at the meeting of the 4th of March? So I'm asking you now. So we're all content with that. Okay, yeah. members, um, agenda item 10, then, if you go to page 52, and you'll see a response from the department on its 10-year sports strategy. Members, we were initially due to have an oral briefing on this, but we had to postpone it as we'd moved to uh, essential business only. The project team hoped to have an opportunity to engage with the committee in the course of the development of the final strategic do document. Members, are you content to note that? <clears throat> yeah. Yes. Sorry. Yeah, no, look, it's, it's really welcome that we have that in the pack and that is starting to um, to gain pace. I think it's very important. I know we mentioned it before, but um, and obviously we'll get to it during our deliberations, but we need to make sure that that includes any strategy, includes um, a, a focus on promoting female participation in sport and also disability um, uh, participation in sport as well. Um, I, I'm glad to see within the, the document that we received in the pack today that there is mention of a cl collaboration with the Department for Education in terms of physical uh, literacy. I think that's vitally important because especially as we um, as we uh, kids return to school and obviously there's the, the, the rightly a, a, you know, a lobby in terms of getting kids back playing sport, which they should. Um, but I think PE in schools uh, is going to be a big issue and I think making, making sure that PE and physical literacy is a core component of the curriculum is going to be a big piece of work. No, thank you, Sinead, and thank you for highlighting those issues. Um, I think you're absolutely right in what you're saying. Um, so, members, any other comment on that or content that we move on with it from that? Yeah? Okay. Agenda item, or sorry, the, the next is uh, number 11, is page 67 of your meeting pack, where there's a response uh, from the Department on Local Inclusive Labour Market Partnerships. So, it states that all 11 councils have agreed to take part and officials have met with council representatives to progress setting up these partnerships in each area. The impact of the draft budget allocation is such that the department cannot guarantee at this time that funding will be made available um, to labour market um, partnerships. Um, I just uh, probably would just want to make comment on that myself as, as someone who sat on local council, and I know many of us did, and we've seen time and time again um, the powers and um, partnerships um, being handed over to councils without the money to follow, and I know that is a big issue for councils. So I think this is one that we maybe just need to keep a watching brief off as well, um, because we don't want something to end up uh, with um, council having the full liability for spend. Um, because I mean we're all political parties and we all have members who sit on on these councils who lobby us individually as well. So our members agreed with that. Do we just keep a watchful eye on that one? Agreed. Yeah. Content. Nope. Then sorry, Kelly, go ahead. Um, sorry, yes, Chair. I just want to say that I'm I'm aware of some councils that did spend time developing up their proposals. Um, others maybe didn't uh, wait up to see what the money was going to be like. But um, it's just we're coming out of COVID. Um, we know that the ministers already had trouble getting money out of the executive for job start. Well, to get any additional money for job start, and and then if this program's not going to happen, I am concerned um, that. Our minister is trying to come up with proposals and each turn is being blocked because there's a lack of money available. Um, Northern Ireland is going to be very shortly, hopefully coming out of this pandemic with a number of people who will be unemployed and it will fall back on this department and the staff in the department to manage all of the universal credit claims and to provide the support for those people. Um, so I'm just thinking that um, I know there's, there's very little more we can do at this stage until we see what the budget is, but there's more and more of our ministers um employment options that are, are not being able to progress i'm just wondering if there's something we can do to ask the minister um to detail it i know that there's another paper later on where, where there's some details and interventions there but all of these progressive ones are seem to be getting knocked back and it's very concerning yeah i i agree with you and that's why i think this one we can't take our eye off this one certainly um going forward um, but we can, I mean, we can certainly ask more detail around this and, you know, and show our support for this. Um, whenever it does come to the budget, we, we will all be making speeches next week. So it's maybe something we want to bring up there as well. Members, content we move on then, yeah? Uh, so, oh, I, I see hands up. Mark, sorry. 
Did you want to make I, a comment? Sorry, Chair. Sorry. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. No, I, I concur with uh, Kelly's concerns there. Uh, and it's not just the labour market interventions through DFC that are under threat. We also have to look at things like uh, the, the loss of European structural funds and the impact that's having on the economy department's uh, support for, for, for such programmes, you know, employability and skills programmes, which is going to be pretty severe uh, in, in the coming years. So I, I think there might actually be maybe scope for some cross-departmental collaboration on labour market intervention, and I think that's something that the executive should certainly be open to and, and, and looking at. Yeah, okay, Mark, I mean, we can ask that question. What, is happen what are they doing um, uh, cross-departmental to, to uh, further these, the, the aims? No, that's fair enough. Uh, members, happy enough we move on then to page 69 of your meeting pack. Um, which is a departmental response in the de definition to affordable housing. The department revised definition no longer makes reference to households who can afford a small mortgage. The revised definition has been widened to include social rented housing, intermediate housing and intermediate housing for rent. I know Mark, you had uh, brought this up um, the, the last time it was on the agenda. Just if you any comment or any other members, any comment or content to note? No, I contend to that okay. chair because the requirements have been around what a small mortgage was, but the flat's been taken out. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, members. We'll move on then. If you could turn to page seventy-four of your meeting pack, where there is a departmental response on the food pallet scheme. This is something that I brought up in committee, um, following uh, conversations with one of my local. Um, uh, community centres. It says the scheme is a short-term response to tackle food and essential items, poverty in a post-Brexit environment and the continuing COVID situation and will be active until the 31st of March. The scheme has bulk purchased £1 million of food and essential items to bolster community food providers, with a further 250000 being made available to food charity Fairshire. Um, Linus Foods have been appointed as a supplier. The department states that, uh, uh, that there are inevitably occasions when requested items may be temporarily out of stock, but arrangements are in place to ensure that it is immediately substituted with a similar item of a comparable price. And the department has recently confirmed this process with the supplier and have advised all participants of what um, to expect in the event of a product being temporarily unavailable. Groups can also request that additional essential items be added to their stock list. So all I can say is it must be very recently, um, because up until two weeks ago that wasn't the case. Um, but uh, thankfully that has changed and that uh, those issues have been ironed out. So I'm content with that uh, at present. Members, any comment? Are they content also? Yeah, content. content. Okay, then we'll move on to page 76, where you'll see a departmental response on labour market, labour market interventions. And it says that all of the initial wave of COVID labour market, in, labour market response intervention or initiatives have been paused, waiting confirmation of the department's budget allocation for 21-22. Additionally, funding of labour market partnerships under employability NI to develop further labour market responses in partnership with local councils has also been delayed, as we know from previous and the current work experience programme and advisor discretion fund are funded until the 31st of March 21. Contingency business cases are being prepared to extend existing provision for 12 months from the 1st of April um, to the 31st of March next year in case funding for the expanded schemes cannot be allocated. Um, yeah, that's again not uh, not great. Uh, members, any comments they want to make on that? Are they content that we note that again and just keep an eye on, on the budget allocation there and how that goes? Yeah. yeah. All right. Okay. Then can I ask you to turn to page 78 of your meeting pack where you'll see a departmental response on advice sector funding. The department provides annual funding in the region of £4.6 million for the delivery of independent community-based advice services, including support to address the increased need for benefits advice and ongoing welfare changes. The Minister sees the revision of advice support service as being of vital importance and has given an assurance that these critical services will continue next year as an essential element of the depart department's budget. Um, I know that this was something we discussed in committee also, and I know it was very much the opinion of the committee that um, we didn't want to see this being taken from the budget there, or the draft budget as stand, uh, or as it stood at the time, but we wanted to see extra money 
um, that extra money that the advice sector needed um, being being given, um, all being well. And I know I know the minister very much is in support of the advice sector services. Um, so I suppose that is another one that we'll just have to wait and see how that pans out whenever the budget is finalised. But again, members, any speeches next week in the chamber, um, members might want to raise this issue as well. Any comment or content to note this stage? Content to note. Yeah. Okay. Then can I ask you to turn to page 79, where you'll see a departmental response on the Sports Sustainability Fund. So 38 governing bodies submitted applications for themselves and their registered clubs. The total value of those applications was $24.8 million <laughs> against $25 million allocated. Um, this is subject to change as the final total value, value of eligible claims cannot yet be confirmed. Sport NI is working through the verification process prior to making payments to the governing bodies for the successful applicants and payments should commence toward the end of February. Um, did someone mention something earlier that to do with that? I can't remember. What it's it? not, uh, payments have started today. They started today. Yeah. All right, okay. Did that just come out during the meeting? I think it was out this morning, yeah. Okay, mm -hmm. I didn't see that. All right. Well, that's good news. I'm very glad to hear that. And as I say, we'll be getting that briefing on the 4th of March. So remember, it's happy enough we move on from that. Yeah? Okay? Yeah. Can we then turn to page 80, where you've got a res departmental response on COVID-19 working practices in DFC. Um, this is on the back of the letter that we had received from so some staff members. And um, the letter from the department states that working from home guidance remains unchanged and in line with executive guidance, all staff within the department have been advised where their role permits them and they have the IT guidance and support to work remotely. They should work from home and the majority of staff working from offices are providing essential social security services for the most vulnerable in our society. Um, and uh, then small numbers of staff are required to be present in offices where manual intervention is required in the processing of benefit applications. So very much the letters that we had received as MLAs, um, the department um, are very much are saying that that's, that actually isn't the case um, to, uh, in relation to the letters we had received. So members, I think um, any of you that did receive those letters, this the letter that we got from can be used then as a response back um, to the various people that have contacted us all individually. Members agree with that? Agreed. Okay, move on then to page 82 where you'll see a departmental response on welfare reform mitigations engagement. Um, while it is anticipated that a wide range of groups will be invited to make res representation on the future of the welfare mitigation measures, it is not currently possible to provide a definitive list of these organisations and the department will share this information with the committee once it is available. I think, was that in relation then to the letter we had sent about the co-design um, and what yeah. what uh, meetings they had had with the various, uh, they haven't actually said anything there then of any meetings about anything that they've had. Um, I think that is because there's been very few. Um, when it comes to the welfare reform mitigations, do members want to write back on that on anything, or are they content to note it? <coughs> Sorry, can I Andy, I go ahead. Andy, go ahead. Sure, I think it's absolutely staggering where we are, and you know, um, I think it's being highlighted rightly. We're, we're entering towards the cliff edge again. A lot of the organisations have highlighted, uh, and they're correct, um, that we don't have a definitive timeline. I know the minister, the department's provided that certain elements will be brought forward by regulation and others by primary legislation. And when we move forward in their pack, there is um, a, a document, not trying to do your job, uh, Chair, uh, on, on primary legislation. Um, but, you know, I, I, I hasn't to be overly critical of the department here, but I don't believe that they've been very forthcoming with this and questions that I've asked, you know, it's coming, it's coming, it's coming, it's coming. It's, this is such a serious issue uh, and I don't think they've worked as proactively uh, as they could have. It's staggering that there hasn't been more engagement with the organisations out there on the cold face of these mitigations. I think, quite frankly, from my perspective, not speaking on behalf of the committee, I just don't think it's simply good enough. No, I, I, I would pretend to agree with you. Kelly, you wanted to come in? Yeah, um, given the fact that the committee um, had a, a witness session with some of the organisations, and thinking in particular of UCS, Cliff Edge Coalition and so on, who have worked so hard, um, there are people willing and able and ready to speak to the department if the department would just reach out to them. The committee has had 
does like we're going through the the liquor licensing or the licensing registration of bills work at the moment and we still manage to get time to speak to these people um how can we possibly work forward what the future of welfare mitigations will be if we don't talk and engage with the people who are at the cold face in receipt of these. Um, I appreciate that time's running out. We're getting to the end of this financial year and the mitigation package is currently in place. Um, the minister has very kindly has said, you know, that, that her intention is um, to bring forward the bedroom tax and the, the two child cap, um, close the loopholes, but there may be other options there. I know that I'm, I'm a strong advocate for the terminal illness details to be sorted out but I'm just really like Andy I'm really disappointed that we don't have any officers within the Department of Communities who can engage with those service users and in particular those groups that have service users ready willing and available um, who can speak with clarity and and are not going to be over the top they're they're very clear about their needs and wants and the cliff edge coalition has provided information so i think i would like to, maybe if the committee could write back to say that a new decade new approach there was a commitment to co-production and co-design and at this stage we're not seeing this happening um from the department the department is a huge department there are a number of people there this doesn't rest all on the minister's shoulders you know she has a team there that can reach out and help and get that evidence for her um i think that we should be supporting our minister to enable those voices to be heard and part of the process no, thank you uh, thanks Kelly uh, Mark, uh, did you want to come in yeah. I do, do just uh, absolutely, you know, would agree. This is just a, it's not an un, entirely unpredictable or unpredicted situation, but we seem to have been on more fucking cliff edges than Wiley Coyote. The engagement with the sector here, it's about getting the legislation right. It's why we were calling for it, for, or have been calling for it for over a year, so we can scrutinise it. It's about getting it right. Uh, because if they come forward with proposals that aren't right, or like they, they, you know, with a safety net that's full of holes, then it, it, it's going to be more difficult to get it through the assembly. To be quite frank. Oh, thanks, Mark. Robin, yeah. you wanted to come in. No, I just concur with uh, what Mark said in his his closing remarks. Yeah, Same I mean, thing. this this is, should be sure. no shock or surprise to anybody. We've been asking for details on this for nigh over a year and have received little or nothing. Sorry, Karen, did you want to come in? Yeah, like, just to concur with everyone, it's vital that that engagement happens with those organisations um, and the department needs to uh, initiate that immediately if, if they haven't already done so. As it was highlighted or raised there earlier, we are all committed and signed up to co-design um, and, and it's vital that that happens, so I concur with everyone else. Okay, thank you for that, Karen. So I think um, there was a proposal there to, to write back then to the department um, around the co-design issue. Uh, members in agreement with that then, yes? Agreed. Okay, okay. Um, I'm conscious we've got like six or seven minutes left, um, so let's push on. Um, if I could ask you to turn to page 83 where you'll see a response again from the Department on Concerns by Unison and you'll remember also um, this was a letter that we received. The response addresses queries in relation to supporting people budget, funding community sector pay terms and conditions and employment and standardised regional payment rates. Uh, members, any comments or uh, content to note them? Of course, we'll forward that response on to Unison. Yeah. Okay. Then can I ask you to turn to page 85, um, where you'll see a response from the minister in relation to pupils returning to school and their mental health. Um, members, again, any comments? Are you content, content to note this? Yeah? Content to note. Okay. Uh, then, sorry, sorry, sorry. Hold on. Everybody wants to speak now. <laughs> I know this was something, Robin, you brought up in the chamber, wasn't it, at question time with the health minister around? Yeah, yeah. And I, th I think, Chair, we need to welcome it rather than yeah. just, just noting it. Uh, I think we all know that there are likely to be uh, problems as, as the uh, pupils return to school um, at whatever uh, level. And uh, I think it is a going to be necessary to have a cross-departmental approach um, to address both the physical aspects and indeed perhaps more importantly the mental health aspects of, of that return. 
Um, and really, I think we, we should welcome and hopefully that the, the strategy between finance, uh, uh, communities, health and education can be uh, put together. I think it's, it's I think it's important, and rather than just note it, I think we should welcome the yeah. Okay, I did have a whole spiel on it, but for time, I thought I'll just open it up to the floor. So you're absolutely right, Robin. Yeah, it should we should have given it a little bit more time. Um, Sinead, did you want to come in there as well? Was it yourself? Yes, sure. Just briefly, I know we're running out of time, but it, it fits in with the theme of, of the response there, and obviously this committee's remit in terms of of sport and physical well-being and. You know, I would like certainly for for us to get a better understanding. Um, if the the Minister for Health, has, you know, are they working um, on a on a pathway on a strategy to ensure that our kids get back to to sport um, and to physical recreation? I think that would fit in very nicely with the holistic theme of of the response from the from the department there. So I think it'd be very much in the interest of this committee to find out is there a plan and a pathway from the Department for Health um, for kids to return to sport. No, I think that it does fit in perfectly and I'm sure you're like myself and like all the rest of us, we've received, been inundated with emails um, from, um, from parents, from others um, when it comes to, to children and sport and, and the, the, the positive impact that makes on lives. So thank you for that and yeah, I, I understand where you come from there. Um, I'm just yeah, happy. Sorry, Mark, did you want to say something? Uh, sorry, Chair. Uh, just on that as well, a, a note, uh, the response and the, the, the remit of the EFC and that's in and around neighbourhood renewal areas but anything going forward and this is where we do need the holistic approach in terms of finance and capturing all those impacted by this it's not just kids in neighbourhood renewal areas who've been impacted negatively or are being impacted negatively and I think whenever we're moving forward it's why we need other departments not just to buy into this but also to pay into it so that all children are offered or afforded the same opportunities. Okay, yeah, absolutely. Look, members, thank you for that. We have then just one final item, which is item 21 at page 87, and it's the primary legislation timetable from the department. I think I'll we'll ask, can we bring this back again next week for further, um, just to, I think it, maybe we want to talk a little bit more about that than just say, okay, members, are you content? I need to move on because I've now got like two minutes left. Um, so members happy enough, we bring that item back then next week and we're going to have a bit more um, uh, chat about it, yeah? Okay, I'm then going to take this all over to agenda item 10, which is correspondence. You'll find this at 171 of your meeting pack. I just want to draw attention then to um, item starting at 174. Um, and that is a email from Drinkaware asking to brief the committee on the licensing bill. Um, we can fit them in next week, which is our last week of evidence sessions. Um, so would members be in agreement then that we invite Drinkaware along? They're very much um, looking at the impact um, of alcohol and the, the levels of alcohol consumption. Um, if members are in agreement, we can invite them to join us next week if they can, if they can't, with the, with the next week finishes our evidence session. So members happy enough with that? Yeah. Agreed. Okay, yeah. then just at page 185 is a memo from the Committee for Health in relation to correspondence it received from QUP on discretionary support isolation grants. Members, are you content to forward the memo to the department for comment? Agreed. Agreed. Yeah. Um, uh, Janice or Sean, tell me when I need to stop here. Um, members, no. then page 216 are two emails from no. participants no. in the Women Involved in Community Transition Programme. The emails express concern about the funding that is due to end. I brought this up, members, a, a few weeks ago in committee. Um, can I then just suggest that we write to? It's funded from the minister for, or funded from the Department of Justice and TEO, and um, communities are the one is is the department that rolls it out though. Um, so can I suggest that we write to um, Justice and TEO about the funding for it? Because um, I know any responses I've received from the minister around this, it's very much they do the funding, I roll it out. So, um, Andy, quickly. Sure, just just very quick update. Um, work, excellent programme. They do fantastic work, um, and I've been engaging with TWN. Uh, I've been liaising with um, the team in respect to this. I understand they're hoping to be in a position to take proposals to the programme board for the wider tackling paramilitarism or uh, criminality and organised crime next week. Um, they're. So hopefully we should have an update on the position on the overall funding of that programme in the coming weeks. 
Okay, thank you for that update, Andy. Um, so members then content um, where we're going with that as well, yes, because it's another one we don't want to drop off. Um, can I then just ask you to take a look then at page 220 where there's an email in relation to the lack of regulation of property management companies. Um, are members content that we write to the department to ask if they have any plans to introduce uh, legislation to regulate property management companies? Agreement? Yes? Okay. I have nothing else on correspondence. Are members content I move on then to agenda item 11, forward work programme? Yep. Okay. Um, members, just then to inform Chair, you. I, Sorry, go ahead, Kelly. Sorry, can we bring back um, for next week for discussion um, <clears throat> the memo from the clerk to the Public Accounts Committee to 178? Because there's a couple of um, reports there that they're holding back that we won't be able to look at that are quite important to the Welfare Reforms Northern Ireland and the Welfare Reform PIP reports. And also, could I ask that on 182, if we could ask the, uh, a response from the Housing Executive? just on this retrofit strategy. Yep, okay, we can do that. Thank you, Kelly. Um, moving on then, agenda 11, members, which is forward work programme at our meeting um, at the, no, hold on. At 4th the, of March. The, uh, at the meeting on the 4th of March next week, we'll be briefed on the licensing and registration clubs, as I say, it's our final one, uh, from the Institute of Public Health Ireland, um, the GAA and DrinkAware. Um, the committee will also be briefed by members of the deaf community on the video replay system, which we agreed earlier as well. Um, members content with that that I move on? Yes? Agreed. Okay. Yeah. Then item 12, any other business? And if you have, you better be quick. <laughs> no? No? Normally Andy has something here. No? <laughs> okay, then I'll move on to agenda item 13, which is date, time, location of next meeting. Members, our next meeting will take place at 9.15 next Thursday, the 4th of March, in the Senate Chamber for those that attend in person. Thank you all so much. Thank you. Thank you, John. Assembly, Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29.